Hello, everybody, and welcome to another PMP end of month review. So here we are, gentlemen. It's after Thanksgiving. It's wonderful. It's December sometime. Let's imagine. And brr, it sure is cold outside from the winter, right? Well, I can uh, I can already attest to that for sure. <laughs> because you know the winter starts in in uh, in September here in Canada. That is true. Uh, I'm making the joke because I'll, what, we, what we've decided to do, and I'm, I'm going to say it even though I could ruin the illusion, but you're going to notice when I change shirts halfway through. Um, you change shirts? <laughs> indeed. <laughs> no, that's how I just, like I'm literally just glued to this chair. Um, the, we're we're going to record this in two parts. So we're actually recording this part in the past. And then we'll record the next part at our normal time. And so when you're watching this, uh, we've put it all together. But I am joined, of course, as always, by my illustrious wonderful panel it's jeff egan and kieran how are you doing today gentlemen things are things are well up here um it, it honestly is just striking winter right now like it still stays below zero celsius overnight. Uh, so we've had it pretty easy all things considered good night it's uh it, the, like as a point of reference today and in, in all honesty it was over 70 degrees today here Nice. Yeah, you're on the Midwest. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, here in Connecticut, it was uh, it was still kind of warm. It was like up to sixty, mm -hmm. but um, sure. we've already had our first snow here. It was like a small amount of snow we got last month. It was a mess. Mm. Pass. Although <laughs> it's coming soon. Anyways, let's talk about some models because that's what we're here to do. What is the PMP review? It's the review of all of the end of month submissions in the PMP Google Plus community, the Painters Motivating Painters. And this is a hobby community that's all about people taking their hobby journey together to improve wherever they are in their particular journey. It's about taking their next step. So for everybody from beginners who are painting their first figs all the way up to masters who've, who've been in the game for years uh, are, are all welcome here. And the fact is there is always the next step you can take for improvement and we welcome everybody. All you need is that passion to take the next step. So, uh, gentlemen, do you are you ready? Are you excited to review another great month of submissions? I am. Very ready good. to rock and roll. I have a I have an extra pair of eyes for the first little bit of this with me here, just for just for those viewers out there. <gasps> oh. This is uh, this is Bilo. He's going to. Uh, He's going to critique a couple of things and then probably lose interest very fast and just leave. <laughs> is, that a, is that a beagle? Yeah. I love it. Well, this is already the highest rated show we've ever had because we showed a cute puppy. <laughs> so there you go. We're trying, Jeff, to get the, we're trying to get the chicks into it. Yeah. Jeff, do you have a dog or do you only have a cat? Uh, no, I got a mouse. Oh, um, no. No pets at all. All right, good. Okay. No, I wish. I. Yeah, I, I want to get a dog. I, my girlfriend and I do, but... We don't have the uh, the time, money, space, you know, right, space right sure. now. Well, when that happens, we'll do the all dog review episode where we just Aww. put the dogs on here and review. All right, <laughs> let's let's Great. share up and let's get into this. All right. Oh, there we go. So, uh, standard operating procedure. Uh, we'll we'll split them up and we'll go from there. So uh, let's uh, let's do this. If you don't mind, gentlemen, I would love to take Stone Monk Gamers Hunter here, only because I saw this guy in person. Uh, at, I was going to uh, recommend that. Yeah, good sure. call. At uh, at at Holy Wars or Holy Havoc, sorry. And uh, and then uh, Jeff, if you want to take Amanda Rhodes uh, submission here, and I'll take actually both the Stone Monks here, and then Kieran, oh, all three. Jesus, Jesus, oh, Pete's, he's got a lot of them. Okay, and Kieran, why don't you take? Them. Did them all in the first. Yeah, I, I suddenly realized what I just committed myself to. Okay, and then why don't you take Thomas's? Sound good? Yeah, sure will. Okay, so let's kind of look through all of Stone Monk's here. Um, so Stone Monk is obviously, as we've seen in some previous months, he's doing his army of his uh, ogre nids, um, the combination of tyranid parts in these ogres that wandered in and kill all these giant bugs that roam the desert. Uh, and I love everything about it. Uh, let's just talk about some of these conversions. He's got the Tyranid bits on the Hunter's back here. Um, he's got the wonderfully striking war paint. 
And uh, one quick thing I want to point out when we've talked about previous freehand with war paint, one of the things we've mentioned is having the nice dark outline around it. So it really pops from a distance and you can see that he's done that here. And I will say that in person, this is just as, as striking as, uh, as, as you know, you imagine. Um, so let's kind of cycle through because this guy has his, da -da! these are his little, um, his, his little kitty cats. His little hunting cats are the little bugs. I don't remember. No, are these called hormigons in reality or something? Is that what they're called? Yeah, those are hormigons. There you go. So he uses two per base to fill them up. And those are his, uh, you know, little kitty cat, hunter cats, whatever those are called. Um, Saber tusks. That's what they're called. Thank you very much. You can see he's using some of the basing pieces here from um, from the, the, the new basing kit to good effect. And actually, I want to show you a really neat trick he did on some of these later pieces that I thought was wonderfully creative. Um, obviously I think he was in, you know, he was certainly rushing by the end of this to get some of these painted, but I think they came out very well for, for some of this being you know, more the equivalent of speed painting. Um, but I think they, they look pretty great. Um, looking through, like we've got some very hard edges here, right. With the, the white line, perhaps a little, little more stark of a transition than we would want uh, in some places. You know, we had, we had to rely on dry brushing a little more clearly than maybe he wanted to. Um, but all in all, as I said, I know he was he was really in hurry up offense mode to meet the tournament for some of these. But the conversions are, are absolutely great. Color scheme is very striking. The use of the dark flesh. Um, let's take a look here. This was his Dread Maw, right? Which is another big Tyranid fig. And this is the reason I'm pointing this one out is because he did something I quite like here. Do you notice these broken up blocks? Right? Sure, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is the plastic piece from the basing kit, okay? Which is actually only like this little thin part right here, okay? And then he took cork and cut it exactly to size and then sanded it down and puttied over top of it to make it look like a big clay brick which I thought was really, really clever. And I will say in person, he's got a bunch of these blocks scattered around his display board and, and his and his, uh, his army. And I thought that looked really cool. What a neat way to do like big stone blocks. Um, great combination of some homemade, uh, you know, great use of cork that doesn't look like cork, right? That's, that's what I would say. Well, that's probably the best use for it because people often, as we've said in the past, use cork to make sort of some relief and platforms. Right. Um, but leave it totally flat on top, which is makes it look unnatural. Right. Uh, this is a case where, where you have very obviously a piece of flooring that is intended to be flat on top, so that it makes sense. But you still have that rough edge of, uh, of broken masonry. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, so great, great work on the Dread Maw here. I think overall, you know, what, what Stone Monk could do here, if you wanted to take some of these up to the next level is uh you know like with some of this smooth out some of these these blends in here as i said we we know we've got some we've got some edge highlighting here that maybe got a little messy right because we were kind of tracing around rather fast um but all in all it's it's very good work and i will say that you know the the, the if the blends get smooth a little stuff like that you, you go up to an a plus army for what is already absolutely an a army that looks stellar on the table this is one of his um one of his thunder tusks i think and uh, what a gross awful thing this is <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is like the 40k version of uh age of sigmar nurgle i know they have nurgle too but it makes me think of the jabber slides actually yeah. a little bit yeah extrudy tongue bit yep um, I like this conversion of having the the weird creature on the head, you know, kind of flying off the edge of his hand here, right? Sort of uh, look like like he's sending forward his hunting hawk. Uh, he's also cleverly attached the tail to the gun just for extra support. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the really interesting color choices he made here that I think is worth noting is I love the blend of like this deep pink into the flesh tone. Still makes it look very organic. But at the same time, I love that he decided to go very dark colored skin on the ogres which makes the blue stand out much, much more, right? And also makes the ogres appear like a very different creature than the monster they're riding. So uh, was, he made a lot of really, really good color choices with this army, I will say. The one, uh, the one thing on this snapshot that I see that might have been a, 
an odd color choice is, is green boots. Yep. And yep. And whatever that green is, that's attaching the saddle to the, to the monster. That looks yep. uh, a little bit odd to me, but that's, that's only my, my tiny observation. I was thinking the same thing in the, if the green weren't there, if it were just a neutral, like a beige or gray, or, you know, some combination of neutral colors, um, yep. It would make the blue pop even more. Yep. Um, so yeah, it that that's in thinking about future projects because I mean obviously this army looks really really great, uh, Eric. But I think in future in the future if you um, are trying to make uh, one color especially striking like the blue beards and tattoos and everything, if you if you have a color like green in there when your primary colors are really pink and pink and blue, um, it, it'll throw off the eye just a little bit so that's something to bear in mind i will give him a compliment conversely though about how he applies blue in some odd places like he's got it coming up on the carapace painted on to these guys and for the sake of color balance and triangulation he even does that if we go back to his or you can think back to his first ogre submission the hunter yeah he put a few mm -hmm. bits of uh of blue on the spears on the spear shafts yep down here so, so placement of that stuff is really is really wise actually and i'll give them full compliments for that absolutely okay. and how creative is it to do blue beards if someone just proposed that to me i'd say that's absolutely ridiculous um, but then no, he I'm... makes it so real with the war paint right if it was yes. just the beards it would look ridiculous it, it would look so stark and stand out but it's not he carries it through to the war paint to make it look like yeah they dyed their beards with the same pigment that they dyed and did their war paint with yep, yep. And there's a pirate named that, so it totally makes sense. Oh, it's a good point. Bluebeard, yep. <laughs> sure. All right. Good stuff. So uh, let's check out what Amanda Rhodes has here. I met Amanda at ReaperCon, and uh, she had some, some very nice submissions. Let's take a look at what we got here. Yeah, so um, Amanda's been posting on the PMP for a few months now, if, if I'm recalling her correctly. And uh, she's usually posting up one or two figures and... and I think she was especially receptive to the feedback that we were giving her, if I recall correctly from the comments. I think this is a nice uh, additional step forward for you, Amanda. And um, <laughs> I really like the color palette that you've chosen. And the first thing I thought when I was looking at the entries this month was that your color palette matches your design aesthetic for whatever this is, a kitchen table <laughs> or <laughs> like some shelves. <laughs> you guys notice that the turquoise and, and tan are? Yeah, yeah. that's funny. <laughs> This is pretty cool. So anyhow, you've got a you've got a uh, a color scheme that you like, which is good. Maybe just paint, um, she just paints to her environment. Oh yeah, yeah. If it were in like the office, it'd be like you know reds and grays or something. <laughs> sure. Um, if it worked in a hospital, it'd be some all pale like pea green and white. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, um, as for technical stuff, so as I said, I really like your uh, your color palette. Turquoise is one of my favorite colors to paint, actually. Um, I'm going to be employing it in a project that I'm just starting this weekend. So I'll show you that in a future PMP. Uh, but what can I tell you for little tips that you could um, take to heart and try to improve? Uh, I, have a, I have a few thoughts. One, I think that there could be a little bit more depth to your flesh coloring. Uh, I think that using some, some washes and mixing in a little bit of flesh tone wash and red or purple um, might go a long way for you bringing some color into the face. And as I look at this and I zoom in on it, um, I'm wondering if you were going for a lipstick look or if you were just trying to paint the lip. If you're just trying to paint the lips to make them look like regular human lips, typically what you want to do is just paint the bottom lip and you want to paint it with a watered down red wash, um, a very thinned out with medium and just a kind of a faint pinkish color and that goes a long way toward differentiating the lip and if you want further um, reference you could check out what Mickey Jenver did later in this month that we're going to look at in a few minutes and how she painted the lip on her character model that she was doing so that's one little piece of advice um, I think it's great that you did the eyes too if you're getting comfortable enough with a paintbrush to use that kind of brush control and uh, do that level of detail that's really excellent the other thing I'd say uh, for one more piece of feedback for you, a little push you a little further, is I think you want to get a little bit crisper with your line highlighting on like the boots, for example. So here, if you look at the top of the, you know, the tall boots, you've got a gray color, which is great. But as we move from the black on the boot 
to the gray highlight to the turquoise, there isn't much differentiation there. I think I'd like to see a little bit of that black on the bottom of the on the, on the lip of the boot as it comes and meets the pants. So if you do a, th what I'm saying is if you do a thin line highlight, just the edge of your brush on the, you know, the, the peak of the boot there, I think that that would um, make it, make it pop a little bit more um, and show a little bit more differentiation between the two portions of the model. So that's a little technique to keep pushing yourself toward, um, you know, a little bit more brush control required for that kind of thing, but a, a thinner highlight on the top of the boots would be nice. But overall, I think you've got a really solid figure. And um, why don't we just uh, flip to the third image so we could check out the full rotation there. There we go. Yeah, so here's an, actually you can see what I'm talking about even better here. The gray on that highlights on the boots uh, go right up against the turquoise. And you want a little bit of black behind that highlight separating the turquoise from the, the peak of the boot, exactly. Vince has got it there. But overall, Amanda, great work. And uh, I hope you keep posting. and. Uh, keep coming back for more uh, more advice. Agreed. Uh, I, I agree with all that. I'll make one more full, full, uh, final small note, uh, which is on eyebrows. Uh, in general, you have to be very careful with eyebrows. Um, most of the time, you can get away with not painting eyebrows um, because most people's eyebrows are so thin or so light, especially with a blonde person. Um, if she has vaguely blondish eyebrows, they're not really going to show too much. Um, because they'll probably be like a light sandy brown eyebrow. Um, but if you're going to do them, then you want to take your color and you want to mix it, this, whatever your eyebrow color is, and you want to mix it fairly heavily with flesh tone, just enough to get a thin, thin, thin line. And then you want to glaze flesh over top of that. Because you're, if, if you're, if you've really got precise control, you can even go in there and do a little, uh, like some little quick lines or dots to sort of break it up and then draw it again. Like there's, there's lots of very, you could spend a good hour of eyebrows on a 28 mil fig, but simple way to do it. Then uh, mixed with the flesh tone and then a glaze over. All right. Yep. Makes sense to me. Okay. Thomas. Okay, so Tom, Thomas is, uh, is bringing down is guiding the planes in with uh, with this orc boy. Yes, indeed. Uh, I've always I've always thought of that somebody, <laughs> some other people have always sort of propped him up as being the uh, the the raver with his glow sticks, but but I always think of him as the guy who's guiding the the airplanes with his flashy things. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's there's several good things that I want to compliment Thomas about on here, and then uh, and then I'll finish up with a couple of things to to react to. Um, number one, on the first thing that we probably look at here, uh, aside from the York's face, is all that yellow armor around him. And he has done some really good job of doing color transition from orange through to white um, on these things. And you get, as we see, some sidelong shots, especially in some backhand shots, uh, a really good look at um, how you see the different segments of that armor and how it's pounded out and, and, uh, and the different shape of it. So that's really fantastic. Um, obviously, he's very good with washes. If we stay on here for a second, we can see that he's on the bone um, that he's waving around, his, his, uh, his guider sticks. He's put enough wash on there that you can get the sense that there's still a little bit of flesh or, or some kind of uh, viscera that's still on these things. Um, and the front end shot, of course, shows a good ex exhibition of how he uses washes to get that ghostly glow uh, coming out of the orc images that are carved out of the front of the bone. So all those things are, are real positive, Thomas. But pause on this uh, on this snapshot here just a, a little bit further a second because this is where I want to transition into my what I think you can do better on. And that is the segments of the armor that you've done in, in the dark gray. Um, these ones, unfortunately, are lacking the same kind of soft transition that you did on the yellow. So whatever washes you need to get out to go from black into gray um, has to go smoother. And that might be bringing on some extra glazes of, a, um, you know, of a black wash or even mix your own if you have to and get some, get some glaze medium and, and sort of dilute your black a little bit or your mid grays so that that looks like transition. 
that might mean that you have to go absolute black in some places because because you're a little bit lighter than black throughout the whole the whole thing it's a bit gray um, but that might be what you have to do similarly on the length of your bone spikes um, if we can uh, i think there's another shot that's a little bit tighter on the, on the bone spikes we can see there do you want to do that one this yeah this is just as, okay this is just as good okay. okay so if we tighten up you can see that when we've talked about bone in the past, there's a lot of striation within the bone. And Thomas recognizes this and he realizes it. So you can see that he starts at the root of the bone, um, which, which should be the lightest in this case, because he goes kind of bone into, into white and then starts to darken out again as he goes to the tip. So that's a little bit ordered oddly. Uh, if you're going to go that way, the white should be at the very bottom and then it transitions darker as you go. It shouldn't go lighter and then darker afterwards. Um, but you're on the right track here with this, with exhibiting this striation that goes on in there. I think that just in a couple of places, it ends up looking a little bit too sharp. And maybe the extension of that striation can just mean more watered down paint that you draw away. And, and you may have to do a little bit of, a little bit of wet blending to make that happen a little bit more convincingly. So those are the two things that I'd leave you with. Uh, but, but you're a champion of, of doing the orange through yellow to white on that, on that main armor part. So I'm proud of you for that. Yeah, and I'm really digging the, uh, the freehand flames too. I think that they came out really well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Nice little mud splatter there on the, on the, uh, the other shin, pad, or I don't know what you call that, thigh pad, I guess. I don't know. Thigh plate. Those are greaves. 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 Okay, I'll take your word for it. All right. Unless they're called something else in the orc world, which is yeah, that could be. They they're probably called griefs with like a. They're, prob yeah. <laughs> they're probably called leg or axe stoppers. Stab <laughs> blockers. Exactly. There you go. All right. Let's move on. So let's see. Uh, I'll take Maroc's uh, wolf here or creature. I'm not sure what it is. And uh, I, uh, Jeff, do you want to take the my newest doom bull here? Yeah, I've actually got, like, usually I just kind of go, oh, that looks really nice. I've got actual things this time. Oh, good. <laughs> Let's no, go. Actual, you actual things. <laughs> I don't want to give it to you then. No, absolutely. No, no, no. no. They're, all, they're all very mild. No, no. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm very excited. And uh, and then we'll go Jacob over here. Uh, Kieran, you got Jacob? Sure thing. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's take a look at Maroc. Uh, Maroc with another big, scary... Oh, this is a ghoul creature. Okay, yes, got it. It's a ghoul king. It looked, there you go. Uh, obviously, again, slightly converted because we've got some different arm extensions here, um, as well as a couple other little touches. Um, so I, I think what I'll say here is a couple things, uh, Maroc. First off, uh, I like your color choices, the skin and this cool gray. This is sort of desaturated, very, very desaturated blue. Um, looks really nice, sort of a slate gray or something, um, or a blue steel almost. Um, I like that color choice. I like the dried, sort of washed out blood that we have down here, where it's obvious it's just kind of, you know, uh, little bits of it have gotten up there and it's all dried out. Um, so you can see like the purple and stuff like that. That's good. I like all that. I like the drops down here on the, on the uh, block below his mouth. Um, that all looks convincing, very nice. My issue with him, I think, is around the blood here, around his mouth, which doesn't look quite spotty enough. Like the transition of it looks rather abrupt here on the end. I'd love to see some more spatter. Like if this is a result of him biting into somebody's jugular and ripping their still living flesh out and eating it while they're alive, which I think that's what it is. Um, Blood's arterial blood spray is pretty significant. So uh, this guy should have little tiny droplets and we could achieve that through some very light stippling of just like dot, 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 slowly like getting more and more thin. So like you got dot, 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 or something, right? So it <laughs> like that, like think of, think of Dexter, just go watch an episode of Dexter and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, and then I think my only other note is 
I'd love to see you smooth some of the blends on some of these muscle striations. They're very striking, and I like how high you're going. But it's some when you go up to the very white, like your your darker <laughs> colors are well blended. But at your your lighter edges, we've got a l- just a little too stark, I think. So those are my thoughts, gentlemen. Any other thoughts from you? Uh, you, you actually, nope. my, oops, go right ahead, Karen. No, I was just going to uh, add to that. Uh, let's let's once again compliment Maroc on his life that he puts into his stonework bases. Yes, as always, absolutely. Hell, always rich with greens and browns, and you know, just just wonderful stonework. Yeah, and, and again, I think that on the claws of this guy's hands, especially, he does a really convincing job of selling me the idea that he's got fresh blood into old blood as it goes up beyond the wrist. Agreed. Yeah, this is a really nice transition here. I, I like everything about this. It just looks like this guy sticks his hand in bloody bodies, you know, all the time, and hasn't washed his hand in months. Yeah, he's just fishing around for something. Yep. <laughs> and I was just going to say that I, I'm in full agreement with what Vince said concerning the blood stain around the face. I actually, when I saw this model, I looked up and thought about what I might say about it. I, I actually typed in blood splatter into Google. By the way, don't do that if you have a weak stomach. No, don't do that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I found what I was looking for. And uh, Vince, you have it just right. So Merrick, take that, uh, take that advice to heart. There you go. Vince, you have it a little too right. Yeah, perplexingly right. (laughs) Dun, dun, dun. Okay. (laughs) All right. Uh, So this is my newest Doom Bull. This is like the Minotaur demon thing from uh, Reaper Bones. So there you go. Hit me. Yeah, and you said that this is your fourth because you have a problem, right? That's correct. I have four. This is my fourth Doom Bull. That is right. Right. Um, well, I think that it's really solid. Uh, I, there, there's so much that I like about this model. And it's in keeping with your Zinch color scheme, which I've said for a while is, is my favorite color scheme for your armies that you have. Um, and with the snow basing especially, I think it looks really, really cool. Um, so I won't go on and on about things I've already complimented for previous similar models that you've done. But I've got a couple of really minor things. I think they're minor. Um, oh, don't hit me. I'm, I'm they, excited. Please. It struck me when I was looking at this. So if you're thinking about like, I don't know if this will be a showpiece, but if you're thinking about showpieces or whatever. So the first thing, and again, it's minor, is if you could, could you zoom in on the leg, the bottom left hand, yeah, down there. So there you have like this ornate little detail uh, stuff. And it's kind of like what we were talking about with Kieran with the gyrocopter um, last month. The... Uh, to my mind, not picking that out strikes me as strange because when I'm looking at it, I see the detail, and at the same time, I see that it's 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 highlighted up, you know. But I think using one of your, you know, other colors here, it could be that gold um, color just to um, pick up that little detail. I think that would make it a little bit more striking and uh, would would please the eye a little bit more. The second one, and we're, we're zoomed in on the right area. And again, this one's really minor too, but if you look at the loincloth that you've got there in that middle fold, that, that middle um, section right there, yeah, you have those three slashes. And I love the slash method, as you know, but I was thinking that it would make more sense if the slashes went more um, vertical than horizontal. You have it kind of at a 45 degree angle there, but if it went down a little bit more, or, or even if you kept those, but then did a couple of them coming down through it, you know, making the cross hatch, which is something I do in a lot of my models. I think that that would, it's a really small thing, but I think it would make a, 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 a difference um, looking at the model visually because the way that that fabric bends, you want, my eye wants to see the brightest part of it coming at that sharpest crease. Um, so that's the other one. And I have a, one other minor thing is um, I love the, way that you work in all of the colors to the flesh with washes and you know you're blending up your colors and washing it down and so you get you know purple you get a maroon color you get almost a greenish tinge too and i see that especially in the chest around all the musculature that you've got there but then in the face where you have also a lot of you know detail i don't see as many of the colors there i mean i see a little bit of the red but like in the, um, the left side of the face that we're looking at there, like, um, yeah, right in that area, and then toward the back, toward the ear. That whole area, that yeah, exactly, right in that area. I, I wonder if you could put in some more of that green 
um, or is it a green wash that you're using that you can see, like especially right next to the hair, the um, the mane here, that right there. Yeah, what is it a wash that you're putting in there? No, no, just just a little bit of you know interesting colors mixed into the flesh to create some deeper shadows and such. Nothing more than that. Okay. Uh, there are no washes used on this model. <laughs> oh, you didn't no. didn't use washes. It was just all, all blended. Yep. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, then maybe leaving a little bit of the darker, more interesting colors in the recesses of the face um, would would uh, would make it look a little bit better. Yeah, um, I think what I I think you're you're dead on. I think like I know part of it is getting kind of washed out here. There's a little more variation in person, but you're still right. Um, like this right here needs some of that red tone. Right. So mm -hmm. because that way, they, that way your hot spot becomes here and here. And this has a deeper color to it. Um, same with right around here. A little more. Yep. yep. I also I've been looking at some of the new heavy metal painting stuff in White Dwarf lately. Mm -hmm. And there's a really interesting method for painting a face. I'm not in love with it, but I've taken some aspects of it that I'm going to use in future models. So I'm not going to use their exact method. But one of the things that they recommend the heavy metal painter does is using washes. And so here, if you're not using washes, you'd, do it, you'd achieve this in a different way, I guess. But using washes around the nose and the eyes, like red, uh, very watered down, red, like a glaze rather, not a wash. Glazing <laughs> around the nose and the eyes and those areas being especially ruddy. Um, so that might, be, I don't know how that would work on a, you know, a minotaur or a, you know, a centaur, a, bo sure. what is it, a bull centaur, bull cent what is something it? like that. Doom bull. Doom bull, right. On a doom bull. But, um, so maybe that doesn't quite apply here, but it's the, the idea of putting more uh, fleshy colors around the face in certain areas. Mm -hmm. No, and that's, and that's dead on. It's absolutely right. Um, I'll, let me, let me real very quickly just talk about the three things you said, cause I have thoughts on all of them. The, 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 uh, what do, what do we want to call this? This engraving, embossed, whatever. Embossed. Engraving, sure. yeah. um, I went back and forth over that a hundred times over to make it gold or not. Because that's the only thing that would really make it pop. In the end, I decided I didn't like it as gold because it weighted too much gold down here at the feet when I really wanted the metal color. The, my fear was I wanted the metal of the turquoise to shine and pop like it does here. Mm -hmm. Right? And I was afraid that too much gold, because this gold is so reflective, Right that too much gold would knock the shine out of here and draw the eye away from, from that. Um, so I purposely left it not as highlighted and not as sticking out to make sure the attention stayed on the center line. I see. Right or wrong, that was the choice. I'm not, I'm not saying that's the right choice. I'm just explaining my thoughts. Um, the cross hatching or the, the, the single hatching, I guess. Um, I'm trying to play around with cloth textures because apparently that's a thing now that we all have to learn to do. And... Um, <laughs> painting texture and so like cloth texture what i see a lot of people do is make one of the things to do is to sort of add these very thin slashes for for sort of rough cloth to show like bits of where the light is catching the the string mm -hmm. uh, okay. i don't know if it's the right thing yet i don't know if i'm doing it yet this is sort of my first attempt at it on a model that that no isn't for competition it's just just for funsies um but i, I thought why not on something like this so i can do it later um I'm not sure overall if it's successful. I agree with you. It probably needs something else. I think you're right there. There you go. Cool. But and Kieran's trying, trying to... Oops, sorry, go ahead. That's all that was. Oh, okay. K Kieran's trying to desperately show us something. I know you can't see it, but... Um, I cannot. not. On, <laughs> on his... In the bottom corner, he's trying to show us a standard bear, Kieran? Yeah, where I've tried to do this cross-hatching to, to give you the illusion of fabric as well. Um, so, so I, I see what you're getting at because I've been trying to experiment the same thing. Yep. It's, yep. It's to do something similar, and uh, and I think that I have decided, much like like Jeff, that that angled cross hatching doesn't always sell it um, when it's when it's fabric. I think that I have been successful in the past on doing that on trying to give the illusion of straw hats on my gremlins that I did a number of months ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, you know? right. So I could do some different angles on those things. Um, but when something is coming out of a loom, it's always done in the same way and often draped and designed yeah. to be horizontal or vertical. That's a good point. Hmm. Yep. Although I don't know that a loom ever touched this guy's loincloth, but who knows? <laughs> sure did. Maybe he's an adept seamstress <laughs> in his off time. Could be. All right. Well, that's a, that is all excellent feedback, and I agree with 
I agree with all of it. It's all it's all choices. It's interesting that you caught on two of the things that were the the hardest bits of consternation for me on this model. That's very funny. So, <laughs> there you go. Cool. You have a good eye. All right, Jacob Wallman. Okay. So uh, the first thing I noticed about this when I looked at it was the the undead cat once again. I know so many little undead cats. <laughs> That's a trendy thing, huh? Everybody's got undead cats. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's not what we necessarily want to talk about and, and focus on here with Jacob's business. Um, but the balance in this model is really good. So as far as doing that gleaming scorpion green on the blade, the boots, a couple other spots uh, is, is well balanced. And uh, green and purple are a good marriage of color as well. Uh, I think as far as color balancing here, the thing that uh, sort of gives away that balance actually is the brightness of the bone. She's got a piece on her uh, on her shoulder pauldron that is uh, that is done in bone, and uh, and I think that just comes out a little bit too light in comparison to the others because it draws me a bit away from from those other better features. Uh, she's got a bit. Uh, Jake's got a bit of a third color uh, on this lady as uh, as some jewelry bits like are on the belt. And, uh, and the bracelets, you know, in a bit of blue tone in there. Uh, and he's smart enough to balance it out by putting a couple of baubles on the lower end of, or the upper end of the, uh, the shaft that's holding the sock. So, so color balance wise is really good here. Um, as you scroll through the rest of the photos, I, I don't know, there's, there's really only a couple others that come into sharp focus. Most of them are unfortunately not, not in too sharp a focus, but the one, there's two things that I want to offer you to, uh, to try to help out. And that would be that the paint on the purple uh, dress is, is one particular point where it looks as though it's going on a little bit chalky. So I think your highlights need to have a little bit more moisture in them so that they don't appear that way. Um, you can probably save this by going in with a little bit of a, we've talked about glazing in the past. Um, so I think you can save it if you go in there and little, do a little bit of, of glazing on that and it'll, it'll soften that out. Um, and I'm sure that you got the capability to do it because the softness of your greens is evident. Um, but one last thing that I want to talk about on the scythe blade is that that scythe blade, I think, would really, really benefit from a sharp highlight going down the length of the blade. All right? So it doesn't have to be your absolute brightest, gleamingest, the green but it should be very close to that and just follow the length of it and uh and give us the gleam of delineation there yep like, are, are you talking the... like down the middle as well as down the the front uh, well at first i really just mean down the middle right so like this line here I think that's yep. the important part. yes yep yeah because then that's the that's the actual part that makes a delineation and it makes sense of how you are getting a capture of in the mid blade on the furthest right, you have your gleam of light. And then on the flip side of the blade, you have your gleam of light at the top and then at the bottom and not in the middle. And it's that line of delineation down the center of a blade that really sells that idea that it's two different facets, right? It's not the same facet because if it was the same facet, then you would just have that gleam of light through the whole surface from front to back. And it wouldn't have a reason to shut off halfway and become absolutely dark on the other side. And you know what, Jacob, you could rewind the tape three minutes and look at Vince's model, uh, the one that we just looked at, because he does exactly what Kieran's talking about there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and most uh, and most guys that do this kind of this kind of thing, that, that final touch is that center, that center gleam of light down the center of the blade to show that it's two different facets of the blade. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you, I'll give you a secret trick. You want a secret? Since I, since I do swords in this kind of method, like all the freaking time, I never do steel blades. Um, here, here's a, here's a fun trick. Ready? Before you put any color on your sword, you should be zenithal highlighting, but before you put any color on your blade, dry brush the blade really, really, really lightly. Okay. Take a soft bristle brush and just dry brush it super lightly. You're going to have to hit, hit it like, so you should be slapping it like 50 times with the bristles to make paint show up, okay? And what will happen is you'll get a little white line here on the edge, and a little white line here on the edge, and a little white line here in the middle. 
And if you're doing it with just the right amount of no paint on your brush with a super light touch, you'll catch the whole edge. And then if you do all your rest of your colors in sort of thinner glazes, which is what you have to do anyways to work in sort of a, an NMM style like this, those white lines will, will get kind of worn away. But then in the end, when you need to rebuild them back up, you have the exact lines perfectly cut. So you can you can much more easily just reinforce them rather than trying to sketch them in from done. So there you go. Yeah, so there we go for you, Jacob. All right. Good stuff. I agree with everything. I feel like we do need one little touch of green right here. That's what's missing for me. Maybe hmm. like one of these bracelets could be that green. Just like, you know, you have all the rest blue to balance that. Make with this. If this bracelet mm -hmm. was this same green, I would feel like this whole model would be in just perfect balance. You know what I think would be even better, Vince? If you if, if he felt like going in there and doing um, a couple of the beads green on a oh, couple sure. of the bracelets. Yeah, just like one here, one here, one here, yep. one here. Yep. That's exactly. a really good idea. Yep. I like that. Good call. Oh, actually, one other thing I wanted to make mention of here is the handles on the sides, being as white as they are, that's uh, that doesn't help out with the color balance either. Yeah, they, yep, they, they're a little. It they look unpainted. Your intent or not, Jacob? It, it it actually just appears unfinished, unfortunately. Yep, because there's no other whites there. Yep. yep. Okay. All right. But overall, very cool stuff. And I love purple and green. You've got it. You got a winning color scheme there. That is for sure. Okay. So, uh, well, here we go. As we, we, this time was coming. We, we've got three great, three great selections here. So I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm going to take Victor. Okay. Uh, who, who would like to, to speak on this, this particular masterpiece? I mean, I want to. I don't want to, you know, put my hand up. If, if oh, Gary, no, that's that's it. It. all right, All right. Jeff, you you, there you go, Jeff. You've got Mickey's piece, and uh, well, that's good. You've been you've been working on some dwarves lately, right, Kieran? Yeah, I want to talk about some dwarves. You bet, I do. There you go. All right, so let's let's talk about some Zinchi stuff, which is I like. That's that's right up my alley here from Victor with some wonderful. Uh, some some wonderful silver tower miniatures again. Uh, I will say I love these little brimstone dudes. Um, they're super fun. Um, so let's talk about what I like. Um, I like the back row very very much. Um, I love everything about the back row. Um, wonderful little color shadings on the gold. Again, these are gaming miniatures, right? These are meant to be played in a like a board game. So despite the fact that you you can generally get away with painting them to not as high of a quality. Victor has went ahead and said, nah, I'm good, and painted these to a pretty darn great quality. Um, his golds have nice shading, nice highlights on them. You can see the little spot highlights here. Um, we've got some nice flame work. Um, the pink of this guy's skin is absolutely wonderful in the various um, tones that he's achieving here. My personal favorite element of this entire collection can be found right here. Right here in this wonderful line OSL that is so fantastically executed. This beautiful little orange that's just capturing on the edges of this blue flamer as he as he sort of grabs his flame and flips it around. You can see the hand lighting up and just the edges here. Love, love, love everything about this little bit of OSL. That's so, so greatly captured. Um, the, I'm honestly, I don't like how the brimstones came out um, because it looks, the, the lines between the, the, the transitions are so stark. Now, here's what I'll say. I think you could fix this with uh, probably, well, if, if I was, with some kind of yellow ink. I think if you knocked this whole thing with a yellow ink, like just slathered it on, maybe two, maybe once, uh, maybe twice, I think you could help your entire situation because it would smooth all this out and bring it together. I think you're white to, to dark on, or, you know, you're like, you're, this is very white yellow, like almost egg color. And it's jumping like whoosh, straight into a deep brown red. Like that's a fast transition. Um, a little too fast for my tastes. So uh, th those are the guys that I'm, I'm not, that kind of let me down. But these three, love, 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 especially this guy. Just stunning. Uh, Does he have a snapshot of the, the backside of those? Uh, let's take a look and see Maybe if he's got it. 
we've got the death runners as well. So I'm, I'm going to talk about these guys in a second real yeah. very quickly. Nope. No backside, unfortunately. Okay. Um, quick talk on the death runners. Um, great work on these guys. I, I don't have a lot of feedback for them. That's why I spent the rest. I think if I had any feedback for you, it would just be their tails are too much the same color as their skin. Mm. Like certainly don't do pinky pinky rat tails. Like, you know, yeah, that looks silly. Um, I'm not, not advocating for that, but I'd love to see a light, light crimson, like a washed down crimson color applied to this. I think you could honestly do it with just a very controlled, thin down, take Karienberg crimson, thin it with some medium, and then just do a very controlled glaze. Not a wash, just a controlled glaze over the whole thing. And molto bene, you're good to go. Um, yeah. Basically the same thing you did probably to get some of these scars yep. um, around the scars. Because you've got the color here I want to see here. Um, and that, would, that I think would really make this pop too. Um, skin tone's good. Rusty armor. Looks good with some very stark edge highlighting. Obviously, my favorite element, and the thing I wish, wish, wish you had done one more of is the green blade here, which is, these is great. You've got the counter slashes here. Again, we've talked about sort of the slashes to get for points of light catch. Wonderful how he did those and then glazed over it to kind of make them look like, these blades almost look like marble, right? It's, it's great. Um, I just wish I had one more point of this green. Um could even be this throwing star back here. Mm -hmm. Could be this other knife. You know, that'd be fine. I, I would accept the other blade to be in the same thing. Just something else that was that color, and I'd be happier. That little um, thing coming off of the back foot, that little point there. Mm -hmm. Little yeah, the arrowhead. Yeah. yeah little could be the spikes on the tail. Could be, yeah, any of those. Yep. Just something else that gives us that green element to bring it into balance. Yeah. That jade is spot on, though. It's really good. It oh, really is. Beautiful. Yeah. Like, that is very striking. All right. Yep. That's that's I right in my wheelhouse there with that color. I love it. Yeah. I'm going to do mine in the future that way. I've done some Skaven blades that are uh, that are uh, brighter. Well, not brighter necessarily, but but more yellowy green. Right. Uh, I like that look a lot better. As, as do I. I don't think I've ever done that color on a blade, but he just sold me. You've suddenly converted many people over. I'll tell you what, Victor. There's... The, the, the sincerest form of flattery. All right, there we go. Uh, okay, so let's move to Mickey and uh, turning the Mist Weaver say here into this this wonderful pleat piece. Speaking of flattery, um, <laughs> this is really nice. Talk uh, in. Yeah, <laughs> buckle up. Um, yeah, I mean, Mickey, you know um, that we're, we're big fans of your work. Um, we talk about it every time you post something up here on the PMP. Uh and this submission does not let us down at all. Um, I mean, the model as a whole is 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 really wonderful. Um, but but I can't help but starting by talking about the freehand on the cloak. Um, yeah, let's let's get to let's get to one of these that where we can really see it. I'm gonna kind of cycle through and focus. Yeah, in. you can move right back and forth. Um, I, I already know exactly what I want to talk about here. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> look at the detail on that. That's really amazing. And notice how her colors that she's choosing there echo all of the other colors from around the model. Um, so she's using the same neutral color there that she's using on the, the branches of the wood. Um, she's using the, the green that you can find on the leaf of the wood, of the tree and um, the blues and purples that are scattered all, all across the model. So she's got a dragon either attacking or circling around a castle. One or two. Really pretty. Um, so that's quite... Quite excellent. Uh, another thing I really like is the top of the staff there, Vince. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you see, and I think, if, if I'm not mistaken, she's mixed in purple to the yellow, and that's where she's getting her, her darkest areas there. I think that's why that, that color gradient is so um, pleasing, because it goes from that, uh, you know, that really, the, the darkish purple to um, a really nicely saturated yellow. Mm -hmm. um, really cool. Um, what else? Oh, we were talking earlier um, about painting lips and color in the face. And so you can see here how um, Mickey's done the bottom lip of, of this uh, Mist Weaver, uh, but not the top. And that makes it look, you know, like, like a, a natural lip rather than a lipstick. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Mickey, I do have one thing to challenge you a little further with, and, and maybe you won't agree with me on it. And that's, that's totally fine if, um, if, if you've done this intentionally, but, 
to my mind, the hair could use a little bit more um, contrast, a little bit more of the, I, I see how you're going from the blue to the purple, which is excellent, but I would like to see that that violet color um, that you've got right below the, the right hand of this model. It's our left, but the model's right hand. So that purple that we have there on the um, tassels. Yeah, uh, actually you can see it best in that the, the image that we were on a second ago. No, there you go, that's fine. So see that, that purple there and how in the hair it looks like almost gray, um, like a bleached out purple, not as vibrant. And I'm wondering if that was an intentional decision or or if, if you just didn't highlight it up in the same way or, or you going a different direction with it. But I'd like to see that purple color in the hair as well. And that would also balance it out a little bit more because um, you know that purple is uh, attracting the attention um, you know um, whereas you've balanced out the blue a little bit more um, throughout the rest of the model so I think mixing in that color a little bit into the hair and getting a little bit more contrast um, might be something worth thinking about um, that's just one one thing and if you chose to do the hair this way because you wanted it to look a little bit more um, uh, more, le less vibrant, uh, then that's you know, an artistic decision. But um, that's my two cents. I'm, I'm going to disagree with you on that small part. I think that she's probably going frosty with that to balance out against some other parts that are trailing away from the model. So hmm. if you look at this overall and you're framing it from, from the furthest points away from the model, it always gets a little bit frosty, right? So, oh, okay. Do you, do you think that's what's going you know for? You know what I mean? Okay. So, so up yeah. in, she's, she's done this specifically up in the staff to have all that frosty business up there. Mm -hmm. You obviously see all the icicles down, down the baseline. Frame that as well. And, and I think that if she didn't do that on the hair trailing the opposite way up top, I think that frames it better, to be honest with you. Well, that's interesting. So, yeah, the most vibrant colors are actually in the center of the model with the face and the flesh and the, the blues and the purples there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. That's interesting. I didn't think of that. Yeah. So there's my, my feedback for this is, is obviously this is stunning. I mean, a duh. Okay. Let's just start there. <laughs> um, like it's um, obviously there's the, the color choices here. For, Fantastic. Um, the blues and purples absolutely serve the frosty theme very well. You get across the, the coldness of it just from a distance. Um, I think you're absolutely right. The purple, so she's created this antique gold by using purple to in, in place of, say, black or a dark brown to shade down her non-metallic gold, which is an excellent choice. You can do non-metallic gold with a lot, a lot, a lot of different colors. and um, This is a great execution of it. Um, I like how she's worked the ice and snow into other places on the model. She's using um, After Effects in many different places. Um, down here on this frosty mist that I normally hate, she's actually put the ice and sort of uh, particulate on it to make it look much more like it's a something rather than just this nonsense, you know, fog. Um, so that's great. I would like to draw everyone's attention in case you didn't see it to this right here. Can you see my mouse cursor? Mm -hmm. Do you see what that is? Oh, is it turning? Like you're, you're drawing attention to the staff where her hand meets the staff? Correct. Her hand is freezing the staff mm. where she's holding it because she's she's cold as ice. <laughs> okay. Oh God. So um, there's no singing on the PMP. Oh well, I, I would break that rule regularly. Um, so it's it's great, absolutely great. Here's my one issue, and and this has been something that's just been in my craw throughout the whole time of this model. She looks too dead. And I figured out why it is now, finally, okay? And she looks too dead. Like, I know she's supposed to look cold and not warm, but she looks too dead because the ring around her eye is too perfectly circular, okay? And what I mean by that is a skull is a circular hole in the head. Like, a skull has a circular eye socket, right? But when you're- the, Like the skull on the belt. Correct. Yeah. Like, like this is, well, this is even more elliptical, but yes. Um, and that's the problem. What I need, let's, let's, I'll, I'll zoom way in here so you can see exactly what I mean. What would kill that, that skull feeling out? Like from a distance, I just get this like sense of death, not like in a good way, in a like, this chick is about to literally keel over way. Um, is we need the flesh tone, I would say from about here. So this is like mid tone on this cheek. 
I need that here and I need it here. So what should happen is the darkness should, if you think about an eye, if you think about your, your, the way your face works, once your skin interacts with your skull, the section at the, like on the crest of your nose, or the bridge of your nose, whatever down there, this is the darkest. And I love the purple. I love that the purple is the color because you should look frozen, almost hypothermic. And then I would love to see that purple just, just fade just enough and get more mixed with that mid-tone flesh tone to break up the round nature of it because she mm -hmm. has these eyebrows and it just makes it look like, like when I zoom way out, what I see is skull face, right? Whereas if this had this right here and this right here were just a little smoother transition. Oh, I'm telling you, it would just, it would pop. So that's my one feedback. On that, I think the simple, I think the solution is actually, pretty simple and that is that she frames that brow to bring the circle back down around so tighten up on your frame again there for a second i'll show you what i mean looking at uh looking at that eye on the uh, to, to the viewer the left side of the eye it curls all the way back down to make full right. contact again with the under eye yep but if, if you can think of how a lot of ladies do their makeup when they do an eyebrow they pull that color back Oh, and like into around the side of their head. Uh, so that closure of it, I think, is what's making it look full circle. Mm -hmm. At that one end to go back to the temple of the, of the head above the ear. Then, uh, and I don't think it looks like that at all. Yep. So I think it's just that littlest touch. And I, I just, I think that's, that's your step away from, from, from just absolute greatness. Not that this is in any way not a great model. That's why I started by saying this is a great model. And you did an amazing job. But there you go. I've been, try I've been trying to work my way around this for literally, I don't know, two months or whatever. And I finally got to what the answer is. So there we are. <laughs> Any other thoughts, gentlemen? Um, I'll get there one day, maybe. When I'm 82, I'll be able to <laughs> Absolutely stunning. Beautiful work. Working, we talked about the greens and the stone. Her base work here is obviously just amazing. The 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 falling ice, the the just everything about it. It's great. It's just great. Okay. The dwarf, Thomas Walsh. The power Let's of the rooms the tells you. Okay. Uh well, as as we said, I've been doing some dwarfs lately, and and dwarfs are predominantly metal and air. So that's what we're <laughs> gonna talk about on this guy um you, you've chosen some good rich colors to that brown of his beard um however it looks a little too much like the gold especially the baubles and i think what might solve that is just to go to one other selective highlight layer on the beard so catch the bristles of his mustache with a bit lighter color or brown and uh, and then the beard tips the trail around the very bottom, as well as also the part in the middle where it bulges over his belly. So you don't want to run the whole line of that between mustache to belt, but at least part of it. Um, if you can just see where the natural light of your photography catches uh, on there, just uh, just emulate that with your with your highlight color, and that'll bring home that richness a little bit more. Um, spin me around to the to uh, there's a backside shot of this guy as well. And what I want to talk about on here, especially, is um, getting some depth into that gold. Now, there's a couple of things that are often problems with you, you, both you, Thomas, and myself, when we're painting a lot of metal, um, gold and silver to, to join in together. And that is we have to do a better job of making that delineation between those two colors. So the runes on the shoulder pauldron and you going from silver to gold on the hammerhead as well, both need a little bit of help by doing some washes in there to delineate that. For surface, that can be a black wash, that's fine, an armor wash like that. On the gold, um, I still hold a pot of old chestnut ink, which is a bit of a reddish brown ink, and that works really well on gold. But we've touched on in the past that so you could also, if you want to go to antique, or, uh, or very jewelry-like gold, you can still do things like purple or even or even uh, green wash to, to make that distinction. So 
I would recommend that you go in there with washes on new metals to make that delineation. And then after you've done the wash, uh, come back in and do some sharp edge highlighting on the places where the light would catch. And uh, that'll drive this home and make your metals look much, much richer. Um, the thing I want to compliment you on is a little bit of brush control. And obviously you got some skills under you because on this frame here, we can look at the uh, shaft of the, of the anvil hammer. Uh, that's all very sharply done to, to, to delineate that. Um, flesh tone is, is, is fine. You've got some high gleams on the knuckles, which is exactly where they should be. Um, probably on the back elbow of this guy is a spot where you can do a little bit of a further highlight of flesh and uh, spin me around to the front if you can for another quick sec. Yeah, I don't know if we can tell much about the face on this guy, but uh, yeah, I don't know that we can get really tight enough to see much about that. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, he didn't do the eyes. At least I don't think so. Shame. <laughs> see if you can get in there. <laughs> Give it a try. I know it's really tight under the brow of his helmet, but uh, but give it a try. Get in there and uh, get in there and try to do some eyes with your finest brush, um, because it's a focal point of the model, and, and everybody's going to look to see him anyway. That's eyes go. are one of those eyes are one of those things that you just need to practice, and it's going to be rough for the first couple times, but it'll get better quickly. And um, it's weird. I put off getting better at eyes for so long that the rest of my painting had gotten pretty pretty solid and my eyes were just terrible <laughs> you know when i finally started doing them but once you turn the corner on it it's it's going to make a huge difference yeah while we're talking about it maybe the quick advice i'd slip into people is you have to not think of the eye as an orb even though it is and it feels like an orb inside your own head when you look at a model and painting it it should just be a white line with a little notch of black that's the simplest way to do eyes, right? The yep. model itself mm -hmm. and the sculptor will help you to define that by the, by the, you know, very often it's a, you know, an almond shape uh, mm -hmm. at best, if it has any kind of volume to it at all. But, but very often just think of it as a tiny white line with a notch of black in the middle. Yep. I agree. Good stuff. Okay. All right. Good, good, very good, Thomas. Look forward to more, more dwarfy goodness. All right. So, um, let's see. Uh, why don't I take uh, Am Bastiers here? I don't know if he submitted this again later as end of month submit or not, but I gave him some feedback and he took it. Yeah, um, I remember talking about this last month. So I don't know if like this. He didn't. Ha he didn't. He isn't here on this picture yet. We'll so pop that up. Let's. Uh, does he have a two, another submission a bit later? Uh, I'm not sure. Let me let me let me double check here real quick if, if he resubmitted it. Is it. Yes, he did. Okay, so I'm going to do both of those. I'm going to do this and then jump ahead to the other one if that's okay. Um, just to to talk about the the difference. Um, and then, uh, Jeff, do you want to take the orc again? You took some of Peacemaker's last orcs, and then For sure. uh, Kieran, if you want to take Andrew's miniature necromancy. All right, mm -hmm. here we go. So I'll I'll I want everybody to look at this and. Think about it in terms of all the feedback we normally give. <laughs> okay. Now think, what am I going to say when I look at this? If you you're, picked... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead you're going to say color balance. I'm going to say color balance, right. Because we've got this big turquoise lizard here. And we tried to do something with these two little mushroom caps, but it's just not enough, right? It's, it's this, this is not enough to balance this. And the purple is r roughly fine, especially since you've got some purple hues worked into the shadows of the lizard. And I will say, I like your lizard coloration very much. I, I, as I mentioned, like he's got really nice tonal variation all throughout this skin. Let's, let's really look at this tonal variation here. Look at how bright we get up here and how dark we are down in the ridges. That's good. We've got some nice dark shades in purple here. Okay. And then I was going to say, we need way more scorpion green and we need gloss varnish on those mushroom caps. <laughs> right. I mean, that's, if we're being honest, that's what I was going to say. Sure, sure, so. sure. All right. So now let's jump up. So I gave him some feedback and, and you know, mid-month and, and he took it. And let's take a look here. Okay. 
So do we have one that's a little shot? There you go. So now, now we're zoomed in. So look what happened here. We got some teal worked into the collar, right? And we've got this, we, ch- we did this ridge in this half teal fade to purple. I, w- I wish you would have done it here too, but that's okay. Um, like that's, that's my only thing I didn't, uh, uh, that, 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 that still made me sad. Um, but holy Moses, the difference, right? Like this looks so much better to my eye with this fade. One, purple to green fades just look sweet, right? Like just as a thing. Like th- that's a cool color transition. Um, but two, all of a sudden we have some balance in the model, right? In a bunch of these, in these little flecks of this color and this big ridge, it's much more dispersed now. Love it. Um, old, new. So absolutely. You can do some jade on, uh, on a couple of spots of the jewelry as well. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Just a complete difference. Um, so I got to say, I love how this guy came out. We got some wonderful basing here. Nice broken up rocks, logs, tufts, grass, mud. Beautiful. This guy's a great, great. Uh, it's, I think it's, I don't remember what, I don't know which model this is, but like, it looks like the troglodon model, but he's not spitting. So I don't know, whatever. I don't care. It's a super sweet lizard man on a dinosaur. That's what I know. And I really like how it came out. So there you go. That's my that's my feedback. I think if you're going to go the next step again, think back to what Kieran just said about gold in the last review, and I think we need some more of that. Maybe like some more shadows along the ridges here and the sides, this parts of the helmet, those kinds of things. All right. You probably purple wash as a choice in the gold. Yep. Yeah, I, I like intensity chestnut myself, but whatever you like. You exactly purple could use uh could use the chestnut, could use lots of different things. Another orc, another speed painted orc from uh, from Kyle. Yeah, so Kyle said that uh, he painted this uh, as a speed painting project, and then it took him longer because he did the colors in the wrong order. And it's always a good idea to bear in mind painting inside out, uh, especially if you want to go for speed uh, speed painting. You got to think through that. Um, so, but Kyle circled back around and got it right, and uh, came out with a, a really solid model here. My favorite part of this is the red that you've got. We can see it best, I think, on the first image. Um, you can see how nicely he highlighted it down at the waist in that loincloth area. Um, though Those corners look really solid with the orange that you highlighted up there. Um, so that's looking really solid. And I'm impressed with the fact that you painted to this high quality in such a short amount of time. That's uh, something that's really impressive. And I hope that you can carry that pace on as you move forward with the army. Um, if I had to give you a piece of advice, uh, Kyle, you said in your description that you had to go back and paint because you'd highlighted up too high uh, or too far on the wood. I was actually going to make the suggestion that you could go a little bit higher on the wood. Um, maybe I'm, I'm curious to know um, how you went about doing that final highlight because if you do too much, like if you apply it in too many places, I could see it being overbearing. But I think if you went in with one more highlight, like take, for example, the shield and the um, slashes around the eyes, uh, you know, the, the, the engraved areas. So right at the bottom of each of those eyes would be a nice spot. Yeah, the, the, the V that that would create. Um, the tips of the top of the shield on that ridge. And then a couple of, you know, random uh, lines just to add a little bit more interest with that final highlight. So... It's, it's not always the color that you're using to highlight that might make it look off. It could be the places you're putting the highlight that make it look a little bit off. So bear that in mind as you think um, you think about uh, what highlight is too much highlight uh, in the future. Um, in addition, uh, I think that your, your metals look pretty good. Um, you, you interestingly chose to um, paint the spear tip metal. I think traditionally that's... That's, it's supposed to be like a napped piece of, um, um, you know, like obsidian or, or um, some kind of stone. So um, it's an interesting choice, but, you know, hey, they're orcs. <laughs> this could have just been a hammered out piece of uh, really roughly uh, roughly made um, spear tip. But um, overall, looking really cool. Um, and I'm eager to see what you come up with uh, moving forward. Agreed. One of the things you can do with your final highlight on wood is go gray. I think Kieran's done that many times, and, and gray really makes wood look old, and it's a great high highlight on wood. 
Wood tends to turn gray with age. Um, I, I think that he can, he's okay to do the, the spear tip as metal, but with, with the amount of beating and, and pounding that, that thing has had, it, there should be very few spots on there that will actually catch the sharp. So that's just going to have to darken way, way down, like much darker than the helmet. Yeah, I think he can stay silver, but, but that's what I said. Yeah, heavier wash, maybe even a quick rust effect dabbed on there, right? Yeah. All righty. And Andrew Wade with Miniature Necromancy. That's you. Okay. All right. Well, the first is quickly become last month they did some waves. over and. Oh, Kieran, you're a little really choppy right now. Same Jeff, is, he, is Kieran choppy to you? Uh, Jeff just dropped, in fact. Oh, okay. Well, maybe that's why. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, sure we'll be back. There you go. Yeah, just, just go ahead. You might want to start over because you really kind of broke up there. Oh, yeah. And then uh, Andrew's become one of my faves. He was my pick of the month last month. Um, and part of what Andrew's paint skills, uh, aside from the, you know, obviously the masterful brush control and, and application to, to his models is the fact that he stays a, a very similar color palette very often and delineates that very well. Exception. And that's where I'm going to start a critique here and then that he has gone with a very ruddy skin tone over this uh, draconian model here throughout where the flesh shows and to do in one place when we look at his armor his armor is very coppery Vince said you can tighten up on it on the midriff And, uh, and you got some going on his over to his armor. But, but where it looks very grainy, that's the chain mail part. And it's done very copper. Delineate enough in my mind from the flesh, which is reflected in wings as well. I think he can go darker and stay traditional chain mail with that. Because he's got framework, not very black uh, or, or very dark gray. To do, do that, and that will be perfectly. But also, in between flesh tone. Um, so that's that's my one thing to, to add to you, and and I'm going to shower you with compliments about the absolute pushing it to very richness and realism um, throughout all of your model. Around that plinth that he's standing on is wonderful. There's several layers of mossy gunk and dirt and opening and definition of the bricks. Your addition top, I running down the edges. Where this, if this is some base that you, if you did attention to away, that's all. All wonderful stuff, and it really this model. And you really backs up really heavily on of the model. That Ellen can see. I see the it in the wings. Yeah, see what I mean. So the striations in the and the lines on the wings, muzzle as well, as well as the creature itself. Um, muzzle of this guy, as you can find. And oh, yeah, so it's all fantastic stuff. Kinds of more. Anytime it is. Send me something to offer, Mr. Wade. I am uh, I'm all eyeballs. Yeah, agreed. 
uh, you were still kind of choppy throughout that, but got most of it. Um, the uh, the I love that he resurrected this model, as he said, from like it's a draconian from Ral Partha or something from 1989. Like, what a wonderful use of an old fig. Uh, that's pretty fantastic. So, yeah, really, really great. Even the use of the different golds on the shield here that you can see, like in the cuts, it's, it's just so solid. And I totally agree with you on the base, Kieran. Stunning. All right. So let's move on. We still have no Jeff, right? We, lo we lost our Jeff. We lost our Jeff. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, you're still rough. yeah, you're still, you're still choppy at the moment. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll take, uh, since we're, since we're missing Jeff, uh, let me take two here and then I'll get, and then you can take, uh, uh, James and then we'll see if maybe you're, you're back on, on board here. So let me take casualties, uh, test Nurgle model, which I okay. would normally give to Jeff and I'll take the, uh, the first time in the hobby challenge here from Emmett and, uh, we'll look at his, his, uh, space Marine dudes. All right. So casually his test models for Rotmus. Uh, which I've seen a Nurgle Christmas army before, and I like it very much. Uh, I love the Plague Bearer with the Christmas hat. Um, my answer to you, like, so his question was, which one looks better? The one that's more realistic, as it were, but in red and green, or the one that's very on the nose and has the Christmas hat? And the answer is absolutely Christmas hat. Um, so uh, I think casually, I, I like everything about it. Um, you really have a lot of snow here. I'm going to assume you got excited and snapped this picture before your snow dried because <laughs> that snow looks wet still. And I don't think that's intentional. Um, I bet this is just isn't dry yet. So that's fine. Um, I like you got some good pustules here. They're nice and yellow and gross. We've got some fresh blood for the blood god worked around. Excellent. Um, I'm not sure if there's any Nurgle rot being used here, but I think you could also probably grab that one and just really put all the technical paints through the through the paces on some of these other boils and such. Um, overall, I think that's good. I think with the green, I'd like to see a little bit more highlight in some of the green. Um, that's my only pushback. I'd love to see a little bit more variation on the actual green itself. You could do that either some darker shadows or a little bit higher highlights, I think would be what would really make that pop. And, uh, and finally, if you're gonna do the Christmas hats, don't forget, you gotta have your little old ball. You gotta have the ball on the end, like you did the you did the uh, the fuzziness around his head. Where's his Where's his fuzzy ball at the top of the Christmas hat? So we need the fuzzy ball. Okay, uh, Emmett, for his for his first time in the hobby challenge, well, welcome. We are glad to have you along. Uh, let's take a All look right. at some Space Marines. Okay, so I guess these are terminators i'm gonna say yeah yeah hey welcome back jeff all right yeah, you're back. back sorry about that computer no, problem. you're fine okay well and, and kieran is having some internet challenges at the moment so it's it's all right i'm taking two <laughs> in a row anyway. oh no <laughs> okay so let's talk about these terminators and what i love about them because there is much uh first of all this yellow holy moses what a, what a wonderful, vibrant yellow. Now, we've got some fuzziness in the picture. I'm not sure why. I see this happen every so often when people post photos. I don't know if it's just the camera. It's getting fuzzed out by the light. Well, we, need some, we need some better conditions for these photos. That to the side. The yellow looks great. You've got some wonderful shadows in here. We've got some great, like, where the damage and the scars are in their armor. Wonderful browns. Yellow against purple. I don't know which uh, chapter or whatever this is. I don't even know if they're bad guys or good guys. Um, but I love the color scheme. I love the yellow and purple. He's, um, uh, he's making up his own chapter here. And actually, if you look at the right hand, uh, right shoulder pad, he uh -huh. actually shaved off the detail because these are uh, Space Hulk Terminators. So they're Blood Angels. Oh, but he okay. actually smoothed that down really nicely and did that freehand there. Which I like very much. Um, let me just, so so two quick things. Your yellow looks really smooth. It's, it's sort of the same situation as we saw earlier with the orc, right? Your yellow is really smooth, but on the color that's harder to highlight clearly, where with your layering, um, we've, we've tripped up a little. Now, on the purple of his tabard here, it's it could be seen as edge highlighting. Where it falls down is where we've got anything that's not just where I can catch the edge. And I see very rough purple, oops, very rough purple streaks here, here, right? 
Um, that's a little, a little too sharp up here. So we've mentioned this many times before you want to highlight purple. One of the better ways to do it is instead of going straight into white or something, mix in either flesh tone or a mid tone gray and use that to slowly build up your highlights and use thin purple glazes of your original mid tone, very thin to bring it all back together. Purple is a pain to get smooth blends on. It just is. It's unfortunately the way to go. Um, now, as to these like shoulder pad things, first of all, I love the bleeding hearts. With the checkerboards, I either need this highlight line to be thinner or I need to see a smooth blend. Those are, those are the choices because you've got this wonderful freehand pattern and it falls down because we've got this like very thick gray upside down L. Um, <laughs> so I, I'd like to see that. Also, um, I'm not sure if we just didn't do enough thin layers of white to bring this all the way back up, but the heart looks like it has some gray underneath it where we didn't quite get a clean, clean, crisp white. I don't know if that was intentional. Maybe it's the picture. I'm not sure what's going on there, but my personal feeling on it would be, I would love to see the red heart with the dark outline against a bright crystal, just pure stark white. And I think it would just pop, pop, pop like that. So overall though, Great yellow, very clean edge highlighting, wonderful recess shading. Um, and these guys are a very cool color scheme. And I, and I love people making their own chapters of Space Marines. Heck yeah. Good stuff. All right. I assume the banner will be done later. I don't think Yeah, and the bases too. It looks like yeah. he's just about, about finishing them up. Yeah, I just don't think he was done with like this guy's face or this banner. But as we all remember, bases, bases, banners, shields. Four most important elements of all of your models. Bases, faces, banners, and shields. Never skimp on those. All right. Kieran, let's see if you're back. You want to take the big... Uh, this is. He says he's submitting on behalf of his younger brother. There you go. Okay. So let's talk about James's younger brother. Uh, that was my... my uh... Nope. My audio, guys. Better right now. It was bad a second ago. No, you, you sound good now. Go for it. Go for it. You're on a little delay, but I think you're good. Talking. Am I... Am I... Am I jumpy? Yes, you're very choppy. I don't know what's happening here. <laughs> if you want to give it a reboot, Kieran, I'll take this one and... We'll yeah. get you going in a second. Yep. Yep. Okay. okay. So uh, James submitted this model on behalf of his uh, brother, but his brother doesn't know about it. So maybe he's going to show him this video afterward. But apparently James has been taking to heart the tips we've been giving and other people in this uh, PMP group have been giving every month. And he's passing those on to his younger brother, which is really just exactly what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, so I'm really heartened to, to hear that, uh, that James has found our feedback helpful. So he's really excited about the tusks, um, and and I, I I agree. I think they came out quite well. Um, I really like the color selection across the entire um, entire miniature. Vince, I want to just confirm that I'm coming in okay, right? You are crystal clear, my friend. Okay, great. Um, I really like the color selection across the entire uh, the entire mini here. I think that it looks properly uh, tropical, like a good lizardman army should. If I were to, to challenge you a little bit further, um, and given that you've shown such good brush control on those tusks, I think the thing I challenge you with is picking out a little bit more detail on the scales mm -hmm. of this model. Yep. So yeah, they, they look a little bit drab compared to the vibrant colors that we have all around. Um, so if you want to keep it in that, that you know dark uh, greenish um, black, you could just highlight that up with adding a little bit of gray um, or adding a little bit of uh, bleach bone to that mix. Uh, that'd be a cool kind of um, uh, almost like a gemstone looking color if you went with that blackish uh, and added a little bit of uh, bleach bone there. Or you could get a little crazier and uh, and go with one of the other exotic colors that you've got on here, the green or the red, something like that um, could really add some interest to, to the scales of the model. Really depends on what, what you want to do with it. I'd love to see these scales on the on the Dino Dino, uh, given a like dry brush or something very lightly, and then maybe a wash with the back to this color, but with a with this color up here that the skinky is. I think oh, that yeah. would really pop them scales out. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. That was going to be my, my input as well. Yep. Oh, perfect. We're all on the same page. <laughs> yeah, but um, but overall, uh, James's brother, uh, you're you're <laughs> doing really you're doing a really good mm -hmm. job. And James said that you're thinning down your paints uh, more than you have before. That's so crucially important. Um, so really, just keep at it. Uh, continue to work at it, and you're going to continue to improve uh, in leaps and bounds. Agreed. And Kieran, it sounds like you're uh, you're you're coming in clear there. So so why don't uh, if you if you we'll we'll see how clear you are. Why don't you take Kevin DeLeon's model here because I see he's on a nice wood platform base and Kieran knows wood. If I can be known for anything else in the world at all, it's that I have good wood. Absolutely, that's, that's all I can ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, this is a, Kevin's one that we had a look at last month, actually, and uh, and we had some some comments for him. He uh, had a little bit of a redo, and to the looks of it, at first, as he just went to that extra level of things, so he did some extra highlights on that wood down there below, um, a little bit more, a little bit more color, or just just another layer of things compared to from what I remember. And uh, as far as I um, think that it's generally stayed and maintained pretty much the same. Um, what he was doing on his three models here as we scan through them is experimenting with a little bit of different lighting from what I remember, right? So he has three different styles of model that we looked at. And if we go to the, uh, okay, yeah, let's go to the Harlequin one for a second. My comment for him on this was um, that on that center gemstone that's right in the very middle of it, uh, he went too bright. He could have stayed, when doing gemstones, people, you can stay pretty dark half or the top yes, of this gemstone with of entry, the, the white dot being this place. But his darkest place on that is compared to the gemstone. So, so that's one thing that I offered to him. Supplies on this thing, um, that blue sash needs to try to find a place to be on this model. I guess some of places that could be, um, perhaps on the blade, you could work in a little bit of blue. It doesn't have to be exactly the same values that share a place with that. That would be good. Um, but I understand that for the most part, he is trying to stay very muted with his color here. Um, uh, and maybe that's the other alternative is you knock down the color intensity of that blue sash so that it doesn't appear so, so very bright compared to the other things. Um, the other things I want to give him compliments about are the horns coming out the forefront. Those are, those are well done uh, as far as looking like a real a real spiral horn and getting to white at the very top and going to darker as it gets closer to the head. The skin tone color is a very interesting crimson and I think that works just fine. It works really good. So that one I'm okay with. Um, let's skip to the Slayer for a second, which I think is the last frame. And what we can talk about on this one is uh, maybe just a little bit of color balance thing. Uh, he's got purple pants and very bold purple pants, like he's uh, going to the club tonight. <laughs> and that purple should probably be balanced out by some other place on there. Um, maybe a couple spots that you could do that is, again, with gold, we talked about how you can do a purple wash to still delineate that and make it look antique. So you can put some value of that into there. But also on the axe heads, that little lizard effigy that's on each axe facing has a little bit of an eyeball in there, and that could be perhaps a purple gemstone to balance that. And Kieran, I bet if he showed us the opposite side of the model, um, the beard is probably braided with something that he could put it on as well. Uh, yeah, he's probably got some baubles or, or trinkets yeah, hanging in the beard, you're right. Yep, and we could always do the single vertical purple stripe or two stripes in the hair as well, like yeah. as though he dyed two of the, the hair stripes up in his mohawk, right? There's lots of options here, despite it being a pretty simple model. The other one is tattoos as well. Uh, yeah, another good point. Yep, purple mm -hmm. tattoos yeah. on the arm, sure. You could do some tattoos. You could do some face paint even on this thing. Um, oh, the flesh is really well done, though. 
I've got one that my buddy Peyton would love. Under the eyes, a little bit What's purple. That? He likes, you know, sometimes with like orcs, you put blue under the like eyes. Yeah. But like a, a little bit of purple. Some, some ultimate warrior war paint. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the one thing, that, the other one thing that I was going to add here is let's travel a little bit more in color delineation from the tips of your mohawk to the base of the mohawk. Um, I think that's, that will really add a lot of character to that. It's a big feature of this model, but it, it's at first glance here, pretty flat because it's just the same color at the base uh, with very little changeover. Yep. Um, so those are my offerings for this one. Agreed on all points. You hit everything I was going to say. All right. <clears throat> so we talked about, uh, uh, this one already. Um, so let's see. Uh, I'll take Kevin Clark's Orcus. I know I know this mini well. Um, why don't we have, let's see. So uh, Jeff, if you want to take Tuna Sandwich of Fies, big old uh, giant ogre guy. And uh, I guess Kevin DeLeon has another one. Uh, so Kieran, if you want to take his, oh, yeah. uh, his that... Goblin. Sound good? Sounds good. All right. I'm going to double up and I'm going to talk about other Kieran as well. Oh, sure. Absolutely. That's fine. Yes, because you were going to get other Kieran anyways, your doppelganger. All right. <laughs> so, Orcus. So, this is from Gale Force 9. Um, from uh, they, they made it to go in line with the Rage of the Demons. Gale Force 9 makes some great minis to go along with their D&D &D adventures. I like them very much. I did one last month, if you remember, the Frost Giant. Or, uh, so, there you go. Um, the This is Orcus. Um, my notes on this are, I, I, I like a lot of what you've done here. You've made a lot of fun choices um, as far as like where the colors are. I don't mind the purple tattoo and things like that. Orcus looks like this. So he looks like a weird demon lord. You've captured all his colors correctly. Um, I think probably my, my pushback here is there's not, my big one for you is, surprise, surprise, tonal variation. Everything on here is just, a little too flat. Um, so, uh, um, that is to say, the fur is a little too monotone brown. The red is a little too uh, just red. I don't, I need some more shadows in here. The wings are a little too just flat white. So you've got, what, what this looks like to me is a great base coated model. Now we need to go the next step. So I need either some washes in here to bring things down. Like with the fur, I could see some dry brushes, especially on these highlights to bring things up. Same with the hooves. You've got all your base coats down, but I need to, I need to go to the next level. I need to see the next step. Um, Cause he doesn't, he doesn't feel done to me just yet. So my, my advice to you would be let's, let's push it with some washes with some layers for highlights. Let's go ahead and go to that next level. I think that's going to be your next step you want to take, but uh, welcome. Uh, apparently you're a friend of John's it's uh, we're, we're glad to have you along in the PMP and, uh, and, and great first submission that you picked a big one for your first submission. This is not a small thing, by the way, like, you know, I, it's hard to tell from the size in this picture because you don't have any frame of reference, but it's, he's sizable. Um, so you re you're really jumping in with both feet there. So there you go. Glad to have you along. Yeah. Keep it up. All right. Tuna. With his, his sexy California giant here. <laughs> yeah. Um, looking pretty cool there, uh, Tuna. Um, I don't know what range this is from. I've never seen it before. Um, but, but I really like what you've, what you've done with it. My favorite part about uh, what you've done here on this model is <laughs> the silver on the giant or ogre's um, left-hand shoulder. I think that uh, the way that you've worked in um, almost a rusty color in the wash um, uh, and, and highlighted up um, with a bread or silver, you, you've got a lot of different um, variation to that, to that portion of the metal. I think it looks really realistic. Um, you know, otherwise you've got a pretty simple paint scheme here. Uh, you went for mostly neutral colors, um, really all neutral colors, except for the, the um, blonde hair. And um, and the flesh, you know, you, you went for just basically like an orangey flesh tone and a wash. If I were to challenge you uh, to push it a little bit further um, beyond painting eyes, which we recommended a couple times already this month, 
is to uh, challenge you to, I would, I would encourage you to mix in a color uh, to your orange paint. I actually saw a really cool YouTube video on this today by a guy named uh, Cujo Painting. He's a Scottish uh, guy who um, paints models on commission. And he had a really interesting uh, demo where he showed uh, a color palette with the orangey flesh color, which is probably like a Talaron flesh that you used here if you're using GW paints. And then he mixed in different colors. Like with one he did green, with one he did um, gray, with one he did uh, purple. And you get some really cool looking flesh tones there once you start messing with the uh, messing with the colors. So I'd encourage you to do a little bit of that and highlight up that flesh a little bit more, mixing in uh, you know a gray if you wanted it uh, like that, or a bleached uh, bleached bone type color uh, to highlight it up. That would that would look quite good. Um, in addition, I want to tell you that the f the face to my mind looks a little bit strange. Uh, you've got more red there, which is good, but you've seemingly coated the entire face with red. I think if you left that ruddy face, that ruddy red color around the eyes, on the nose, and on the bottom lip, and you went back and highlighted the rest of the um, face with the flesh tone over again, and then went up one more highlight, I think you'd, you'd really uh, um, show a great improvement uh, to the flesh tone of the model. Because um, right now it looks a little, like the whole face is ruddy in a way that looks a little bit unnatural. Um, but overall, I think you've got a cool looking model here, and um, eager to see how you continue to improve across the months. I think that's his, uh, that's just his tan that you're seeing there. Uh, his tan? I, yeah, just on the face. Um, his California tan. Exactly. <laughs> I, I think one thing I would say if you wanted to, to take this up a, a little bit of a level, I think you could work the red out to the rest of the body too. That would be another way to go, right? If, mm -hmm. if all his skin had that ruddiness, like especially in shadows and stuff and you know everything but the highest highlights had that ruddiness to it, I'd be fine with it. Um, one thing I would say is I'd love it if we broke up all the flesh on this guy with some tats. Even if they're just some simple like bro tats, you know, some barbed wire around his arm, you know, so just <laughs> stuff like that. Um, mom, mom, maybe written. Yeah, like whatever. Just he, yeah. he, like just some some fun tats around this guy would really, I think, take him to the next level. Whenever you got a big muscle guy like this, that's just got like flesh everywhere. Breaking that up with some tats or some war paint or something like that, I think, can really take the model up to the next level. So, yeah, yeah that'd be fun. All right, little goblin. His name is Gleek. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cute. Yeah, well, Gleek, Gleek is a pretty fun, simple model. Um, you get the idea that he's going to cast some dirty magic on you. You don't know what's coming. Um, let's compliment uh, Kevin on a couple things here. First of all, choice of goblin skin tone is the correct choice of goblin skin tone. I, I think, think we're all in agreement there. Yeah, yeah, the really bright green. Uh, and he transitions um, on a short space from from dark to, to bright um pretty well um the cloak obviously is is going to be very simple it's going to be black and he moves into gray there um you could probably smooth in a little bit sharper highlight on the on the black uh it's it's a difficult thing so you have to do it subtly and be and be selective about the places it goes um but i think there's a few spots that that could benefit just to sharpen up what's otherwise a pretty flat and dominant space area on here. But actually what might even be of better value is to add some other visual interests that you're gonna to have to be creative about on here, Kevin. And what came to mind is maybe around the cowling, very often seen, and I've done it myself on some goblin shamans where I do some, some triangular dags that frame that. Um, you could do it around the cowling that goes on there. You could do it on the bottom of the skirts or even at the cuffs where the, where the hands are coming out. And uh, on this model, I wouldn't go with too wacky of a colors. You could do it in sort of a bone color maybe. Um, and, and I say bone because I don't think that I'd encourage you to go to all the way to stark white. Uh, that'd be a little too tidy for a goblin. But some bone color in there would be really good. Um, maybe... You know, you can choose another primary color that's very muted, uh, or even sort of a sort of a brownie brownie yellow. That might be okay because that'll balance out against the pouches that he has around his belt or the ropes that's holding his pants up. Yeah, so there's a couple of couple of recommendations there. Um, but but yes, yeah, so obviously the the winner on here is uh, is green skin tone and well done. And uh, let's everybody else know that he got in there 
and did the eyes. Did the yep. eyes properly. Very, so. very crisp, very clean eyes. Yeah, I like it. They really pop too. It just shows how much eyes make a difference. Like, look how yeah. this guy is staring at you. He looks angry. Yeah. He's ready to go. And I agree. The dags were the first thing I thought about. Like, I, I totally agree. It's it's very. I'm I'm a hundred percent on board with that. A couple little dags around the hood or the the sleeves. Mm, it would be the also. Go. Also, real quick, um, the under the eyes. Uh, I think it, he looks especially menacing because of the way he painted the um the bags under the eyes too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's good yeah. stuff. Uh, I believe you have part two with your, oh, your yeah. doppelganger. Let's go look at my the work by my namesake, mm -hmm. my my compatriot in uh, in nomenclature. <laughs> <laughs> it's the nerdiest way to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to use some long words with uh, at least four syllables just to sound impressive. That's perfectly That's cromulent way to say it. I fooled nobody. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Um, Okay, well, Kieran, uh, Kieran has progressed uh, a fair bit here. He, he did put up his first submissions a few months ago, from what I recall. And uh, I want to I wanna pose a couple of questions to you that maybe I, that you can reply to either to these submissions or to your next ones that you do. And I want to ask you about how you transition paint onto a model. And my, my simple question would be, do you pull it out of the pot onto a palette or do you go straight onto the model? And the reason I'm asking that is because the paint shows texture and, and it's not just one color. Like it's, it's all your colors. It's in, it's in the flesh. It's in the, uh, the metals. It's, it's on your, your primary color. So I'm worried that going into your paint. Sometimes that can be the primer. So that would be my second question for you is how's the primer going on here? Is the texture coming in there? Way, what we're gonna talk about is, so if you're using a primer on there, lose that pebbliness. I'm afraid you're working on a foundation that you're not gonna be able to do much about. So um, that means changing primers. Uh, and I know that other talks that we've had about primers in the past is, for it. You can buy a can for three to four bucks, uh, but you're going to get crap quality. Or you can go and buy what I think is the best in black primer, at least, is the Games Workshop brand that is going to cost you in Canada anyway, 15 plus. But it's it's the most satisfying. It's the smoothest. There's probably a couple other mid-range ones in there that you can find a middle ground on, but it's really important to lay that foundation with the right stuff. And you don't have to prime heavily, especially on, on these Games Workshop plastics. You can go on light. Um, you don't have to saturate it because uh, that can sometimes be where this pebbling comes from too if you're just laying it on too thick. But it doesn't look like you're obscuring uh, too much of the model. But predominantly overall, that's, that's my critique of these things, Kieran, is when you're going forward, think about that foundation. It, so if it's not the primer and it's your paint, it's really important that you get your paint out onto a palette to it so you can thin it down so that this kind of pebble, that may mean that in some cases you're doing two coats, especially on your whites that you're doing here on your paler colors. You have to suck that up and it's going to happen um, because otherwise you get that rough texture. So whether it be palette, being the problem or primer being the problem, that's predominantly the thing that you need to fix at this point in your of painting. Um, let's lay some compliments down because there's certainly some play. Your brush control is, is spot on. Your accuracy of your paintbrush, really good. Uh, I mean, we're going to see on this guy here that you've written outdoor font to the scroll work that goes on the shield. But even beyond that, when you look at the at the armor and where you've gone the gold onto the silver, all of that's very accurate and it's perfect. Struggled with this uh, starburst fanning on the, uh, on the head of the horse when I painted this very same model to get that sharp all the way to the point. Uh, but you've done it here. So very confident that you're gonna be able to manage your paintbrush as you go forward. So it really is just the managing of the paint that, that you need to work on improving at this point. Yeah, and I just, that? 
I just, uh, I think I'd echo everything you'd say. Uh, you said there, Kieran, and, and second all of it. Um, I want to also say that the placement of the colors for the Altdorf paint scheme uh, came out really well. So the way that you've um, mixed up the feathers colors, you split the shield, and uh, even split the, um, the, the cloth that comes on the saddle. Uh, all of that mm -hmm. works really well together. You've placed the, it's, there's an art to placing the colors, as we've talked about many times on the show. And you've you've achieved it quite well here. I agree. I have one quick note on the freehand. First of all, good freehand. Glad you did it. Excellent. Good writing. What do, I have one problem though that I, I cannot you're going. get over. It is killing me. I know where you're going. Where am I going? <laughs> Bottom of the R. Correct. It's a small R. Either either you're either you didn't finish the R or you used a small R. Oh, oh yeah, I hadn't even considered that. But I thought I just forgot. Word. Correct. You All the rest of these word. are caps, and then this is small r. That is that sends my brain into like a, a spinning dimension <laughs> I cannot escape from. Um, like in writing, we expect to see groups in like caps. Either if we see a group of letters in caps, and they're all in caps, right? So, like, just finish that R. For the love of all that is holy, finish that R. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I agree with Karen and Jeff. Great paintwork. Your color scheme here is great. My other quick note is, what's going on with these bases? Are these not done? I'm going to assume these aren't done. I will give you the benefit of the doubt that they're not done. And this is just your texture, and you're going to go in and finish them. So there you go. Well, I'm sure he will. Yeah, judging by this guy's artistic things, things elsewhere, uh, I'm going to give him that doubt, too. Yep. In which case, I'm excited for them because I like how much mud of this, like, fun mud texture and rocks I'm seeing down here. I like what's going on with that. So I look forward to seeing that. Okay. Moving on. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, we're – do we just jump that far? I guess so. Okay. Uh, our last three. All right. So uh, let's say – I'll. Uh, why don't – Jeff, why don't you take Justin's here? Because I think this is right up your alley with this color scheme here. <laughs> and, uh, I'll take the Zangors and uh, and and uh, Kieran if you want to take the these fantastic conversions from uh, Ryan Easterling. Ryan stuff. Good? Yeah, you bet. All right, let's do it. Yeah. So uh, Justin. Well, first of all, yes, this is my color palette. Uh, and second, I actually held these models in my hand before these Nexu models because I played Imperial Assault, which is an awesome game. Uh, but it looks like here he might be using them as like salamanders or something for Age of Sigmar. Yeah, I think that's what so he's that's, doing. Yep, Razor right. Dawn for salamanders. Razor Dawn, yeah, perfect. Yeah, so they fit perfectly. I never thought of that when I was using them in Star Wars. Um, so it's looking really good. Uh, what I really admire about what you've done here is that you've got these two Monopose Fantasy Flight game figures, and you've made some subtle alterations to them to make them different. So you have um, a little bronze piece sticking off of the one on the right, and then you've got uh, two feathers on the one on the left that you've painted up uh, yellow and scorpion green. Excellent choice. Um, I also really like the way that you've, um, you've painted up the teeth here. Uh, I think you could get a little bit finer with with, um, with the highlighting there uh, and make V's instead of um, um, you know dots. So I think that could be improved. But I think that you make the model look really um, fierce and aggressive with the way that you've highlighted up the teeth uh, to that color. Uh, can we continue to flip through here? I want to see if we get some more angles. There's the next two. That's what it looks like unpainted. Yeah, good use of foliage here. Um, that's another way to make these two models look different is changing up the bases so dramatically. And what else we got? Yeah, there's another side. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, well, overall, I think that you've got a cool scheme here with the, um, the blue and, and purple. Can we go back to image number one for one second, though? Mm -hmm. So the one thing I'm wondering is uh, why you've painted the skinks with such a different color scheme than than these models here. Like, you know, um, you have green and yellow on the Nexu models, and I actually like the way you've done the green and yellow there a little bit better. I think that on the skinks, you have a different color green and a different color yellow. It's more of like a golden yellow, um, and instead of that like vibrant sunburst yellow that you have on the feathers there. So 
to my mind, the the models being in the unit with with slightly different versions of the yellow and green, it it looks a little bit strange. So you might have had a reason that you want about doing it that way. But when you're thinking about unit composition in the future, you might consider that if you're going to put a yellow down uh, in multiple places and multiple models, you want to make sure you're using the same base color yellow and hollowing it up the same way. So that's one thing to keep in mind. But um, overall, I think uh, really cool looking models. And I especially like the Nexus. I think that, that you've done a really excellent job with the, what could be just a very monotonous um, single monopose uh, um, sculpt. I agree. Um, I, I wonder if maybe the skinks aren't done because they look kind of monotone. So I wonder if maybe he wasn't just putting them in there at the moment to kind of show what they look like because none of the other pictures have them. So Oh, that's possible. Okay. Yeah. And if that's the case, then, then right on. And and maybe also because I see that the nails of the um, Nexus look like they're not painted yet, so maybe he's coming back to that too. But those should be painted up the same way as the teeth, I think. Yep. All right. So let's go ahead and jump to the next one, the Zan Gore. Uh, so you know we're getting the boxes of these, by the way. For um, they're they're coming out for forty k, but we're gonna get actual boxes of Zan Gores for uh standalone so very excited about that nice. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I, I love everything about these guys um so victor's done some interesting things here very zinchian color scheme we got the purple and uh to magenta um which i actually associate more with slanesh but that's okay he did like zinch's main thing is have a lot of crazy colors which we've certainly achieved here and uh, as usual, Victor's done a great job. What I really want to compliment him on here on this is I talk all the time about when you're using gold to really break it up and use lots of, you know, use your shading, use your highlights to make the gold look more visually interesting to have a lot more uh, uh, tonal variance. And, and man, these are some of the best he's done with it, right? Um, I, I look at a lot of this gold. There's so many wonderful washes and highlights done in here to pick these parts out. Um, and also to return to something you said earlier uh, when we talked about the gem. Right. So you look at how much of this is actually dark or mid tone, at least. And then only down here, he gets light. I think I'd like to see Victor one more sort of very, very thin mid tone glaze to bring that all together. Um, but overall, it's, you know, you, it's obviously it's going the right direction. We know Victor can do great gems because we've seen him plenty of times. Um, so all in all, I, I, I very much like him. I think probably you know, they could be a little smoother in their blends. I think that's really the the main thing here. But of course, again, it's always tough to judge with Silver Tower because, you know, some part of Silver Tower is like, well, let me get this painted so I can play the board game, <laughs> right? So it's it's usually a little bit more of a speed paint experiment. Um, so they, I like his color placement. Obviously, the blends could be a little smoother overall. I can see some, some chalkiness to some of it. So I feel like we probably weren't working in as thin as we could have. But my guess is Victor knows that very well and made intentional choice here, just because given what we've seen, when he what he can do with his blends, when he when he wants to take the time, it just seems like the obvious you know thing. So, but very cool, great color choices, absolutely great color choices. That purple against the turquoise of the shields is uh, is freaking it's fantastic. Beautiful. Yeah, that's such a great combination. Yeah. Okay, uh Ryan Easterling. Yeah. Well, let's let's spend some time looking at these guys a little, a little bit more closely. And for those of you that you will notice that what Ryan has taken blood letters and demonettes and play bearers and mashed them all together. Yep. Got a number of places in here <laughs> where he's got like the guy leading up front on the uh, body. Right, there's a ton of anti bear heads spread around, etc. Um, using the claws from the demonettes to mash in there, and and you know what? It, at first, when I looked at these, I thought it looks pretty natural. Like nothing seems it's all it's all proper. Uh, but then you realize that these models actually do all kind of blend together. And all these different demon. Uh, uh, with the exception of the horror, very difficult to mix in any kind of pink horror stuff with the shape of these things. That's the that's the first place we go in compliments. So I, I really like the usage board of all that demon stuff to come together here. Now, Ryan posed a question up in here, and he 
who's sort of throwing it out here to, to the three of us to stay. There's her skin tone and some in here, and he's done some color variation to try to delineate that. And he asked the question, does it look those color and darkness throughout the unit as a whole? And I think my answer is yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, you may even push a little bit further and it'll still look fine when they're all there together as a group. Um, there's a couple of things that pipe in on here though. It's the use of metallics in, a, in may, maybe too many places for what is otherwise sort of a, just an organic um, creature. I know I know it's another worldly creature, but but the too real world and too... Um, so the natural place to go with that is obviously like, the tips on the horns and the horns themselves doesn't seem like seem like a place for metallics. I think I'd like you to make a nose look bone or you can maybe pull out a different color and do them in some kind of crimson if you wanted to because you have red spotted in the various other places like tongues and open sores and buboes on the plague bearer things. So you can go into the red spectrum with there, I think. And, and I think I prefer that over silver for the horns on all these things. How do you guys feel about that? Uh, I agree. Some really like some fairly stark horns, like they get to white fast, but they use red as their shade color, like a crimson, I think would be fantastic. Yeah. And maybe you can emulate something. Uh, the guy that does that really well and puts that in his spectrum is uh, Bleep Bloop. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. He has some stuff in last month's that, that exhibits what we're talking about there. So if you want to scan back to that, um, it's not too far back in the past. Yeah. I think if they were bright white at the base, so that that way they really stood apart from the brown of the flesh and then went up to red, black, like just the tip here was black into a dark crimson into red into then sort of this yellow white into bright shock white. I think that could look really awesome. Yeah, that's a good idea. I agree with you. Yeah. It would also, because he's got some red into his bases and the stonework yep. on the bases too. So that's a good balancing point there. Yep. Um, obviously, uh, Vince is going to talk to you a bit more about bases than me, but, but you can probably add some other depth of texture into that, um, and go a little bit, a little bit paler in some places. Um, and on the flatter parts of your bases where you, where the cork has left it alone, uh, there's going to be, there's going to need to be some other texture that goes onto their rind, I think, before you call these done. Yeah, I, I would agree with everything that you guys have said so far. And I just want to um, particularly answer the question uh, that you raised, uh, Kieran, that he that Ryan um, encouraged us to answer. I, I definitely yeah. agree with you guys that you can do the variation uh, within the unit. I think that looks quite good. And uh, I'd actually recommend that you do that rather than doing different colors for each unit. I think that um, as you look at the army as a whole, if you were to do dark, medium, and light in different units, I think it would look a little bit strange on the display board. Uh, so I'd recommend mixing those in. Uh, you're not going so far, you know, apart that you get like a Skittlesy look or anything. You know, you're just talking about different tones. So uh, I think go full steam ahead on that. Um, yep. Totally agree. Yep. Um, he's got one last frame. If you go to the fifth frame. Is this a banner? Mm. Let's see if we have anything. Um, you know what I got here is it is some kind of old dripping wax on this corn banner as uh, washing down blood. But I kind of like the of a dripping wax here or a melting flesh. I agree. Uh, I think it looks great in that you color. You told me on that. That's really yeah. good. Yep, I agree. I also have to quickly compliment this double-headed <laughs> plague bearer with just the Slaneshi demon head just hanging out, just probably yelling Over and screaming shoulder. all day. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty great. That's horrific. <laughs> That's somehow to get ahead in advertising stuff right there. That looks good. Very yeah, awesome. So I, think this, this, I guess the conclusion, Ryan, is that, yeah, go ahead color tones uh and lighter to darker throughout the unit that's fine perfectly good add some good character agreed all right so that brings us to the end of our first half of our review 
So we're not going to do our normal big sign off. Obviously, we're just going to call it right here and you'll see us back in just a moment as we pick up with the rest of them. Only for us, it will be weeks. Bye bye. See you in 30 seconds. See you in, see you in a few seconds. We're calling this intermission. All right, we're back. It's been 30 seconds or two seconds or some amount of seconds for you, but much longer for us. Maybe I'm wearing the same shirt. Maybe I'm not. Who knows? <laughs> but we're back and we're ready to finish out the review. So Jeff and, and Kieran, welcome back, guys. Well, after that very brisk costume change, yes. I, feel, I, feel good. I, feel, I feel like a new man again. Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel older. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Lost some hair. <laughs> yeah, well, you've and got put your... On, and put on a cardigan. Exactly. Yeah. He's got his old man cardigan ready to go. It's as it's it's a frosty December day and we're we're ready to finish this review. So we're just going to jump right back into this and pick up where we left off. Um, so when we left off, we left off with uh, Ryan Easterling and his uh, his budget of Sigmar uh, submission, the chaos court of Carcosa. And so now we're picking up. So um, what I was working on last time we did this and what I finished obviously since then was this girl. I think I had shown off part of this to to you guys actually during the last show mm -hmm, um, for sure yeah so this was this is my finished alorial um and this was a big project i think that's probably not too surprising to say um <laughs> just, just, yeah she, she wasn't yeah. small and quite the rainbow spectrum she is indeed and uh i she has she has some minor conversions of course because she is over an inch tall so i was uh morally responsible for converting her but obviously the biggest thing was getting her up off the beetle um and actually having her like summon the beetle out of its little hole i thought that was the the thing i wanted to achieve here the most but in the end i'm i'm really happy with how this came out i i re i changed her wing position changed her little weird stick tree hand into a normal elfy hand and uh, got rid of all the extra junk and swords hanging on the beetle because i'm not a fan of those the tree is just a like I, it's just twisted wire within like spackle and green stuff and stuff over it. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously the, the, um, the cave or, or whatever you want to say is a bunch of like indoor pine bark put together then with house putty and, and uh, Vallejo paste and lots of other stuff like that. But that base is, was quite an ordeal. Um, so, uh, but yeah, yeah there I, you go. I have worked with that kind of uh, cedar bark before to, to make these kinds of rock structures. Mm -hmm. and um, tried all kinds of things like like pins to stick through them to make them more sound and uh, the hot glue gun was making a mess all over the place you know and various <laughs> other pastes and spackles as you described so yep. try to hold it together um, yeah it was always a, always a good challenge but I was making a big you know foot and a half tall rock face with it so that was uh, was a trial over ages Oh, that's but, that's quite a it's quite a height. Yeah, that's certainly taller than this, no doubt. Yeah, but I'm saying I appreciate that uh, that even the effort to do something like this uh, would have been hours. Yes, that is that is, you are not wrong. Um, but I'm I'm happy with how she came out. I don't want to sit here and be like, "Ooh, look at what I did." But like overall, I must say I'm I am very pleased with how she came out. This was a real try hard fig. Um, you only get to paint a model like a L'Oreal realistically like once a year at best. Right. So this was probably the most time I have ever spent on a model. She was probably approaching uh she's probably approaching ninety hours and she had that was like over eight days. So there you go. <laughs> to to be completely fair though, you painted RK on this year too, didn't you? Uh he was last year. I was think he? maybe not. Mm, I don't know. I think he was this year. Ever chosen came out in the spring, didn't it? Or late winter. <laughs> So anyhow, you've done two. Ma what my point was, I was complimenting you. You have two massive, beautiful models that you've done in, <laughs> in one calendar year. It's really great. Mm -hmm. and I really like the the transition on the uh, tusks of the beetle, there, the horns or whatever we're calling those. Um, I, I think it looks so nice and vibrant, and the transition so smooth. It's really beautiful. Um, let me ask you this. I wonder if you did this on purpose, but it's the thing that I appreciate the most about it <clears throat> is that. The carapace of the beetle reminds me of Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis. Mm -hmm. was, um, that in your, was that in your strange <laughs> thought at all? 
No, but that's cool. That was not in my thought. Um, my thought was, so this took a lot of pre-planning, surprisingly enough. I didn't just jump into painting her. Um, sure. But I, I Googled and Googled beetle after beetle. I was just like digging through images of beetles. And I found this beetle that fluoresces that he ha who has a green carapace that like fluoresces kind of all over him, that yellow, orange, red. And so <clears throat> um, I wanted to have that kind of in there. And I wanted to work in that this sort of effect here, what I think you're talking about, right? Even into the deeper greens yeah, of this kind of stuff. Um, it just kind of was something that, that I wanted to capture, like the continued fluorescent in different shades of, of the, the shiny carapace. So um, I, I didn't think of it, but that's, that's a cool comparison. I dig it. Not intentional. Hmm. Well, one other thing that you did really well, I think, is so the basing matches the colors of the model really well. Both, I guess, two models really here, but at the same time, the basing doesn't doesn't attempt to dominate. I mean, the the scene is is very dominant, and that you you see the story being told. But like for example, the colors on the flowers, they don't distract attention from the colors on uh, Alario's wings or on the beetle. Um, on its horns or whatever we're calling that. And, and so that was a, you used just the right amount, I think of uh, pink and yellow and, and white flowers to, to achieve that effect. It's difficult to not make the base dominant when you've got so much going on there in terms of vegetation. Yeah. And there's a lot of layers of vegetation there. Believe me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, uh, I told my wife that for Christmas, I just gave her the site where I normally enter or like order my flock and flowers and stuff. And I said, just go nuts. That's that'll be that'll be a great Christmas gift because I hit my collection hard for this. My favorite is my favorite for that stuff is Scenic Express. I don't know if that's what you use, but um, it's a good good site. Good tip. I do not, but I'll check it out. Yeah, check there it out. Um, my other big goal with her was to not use any metallics whatsoever. So nothing on this and any anywhere on this model is is there a hint of metal paint? Um, but but really, where would you put that anyway? Aside from the spear. Yeah, I mean, there's places it could have shown up. I mean, gold shows up, like, if you look at the stock model, it shows up on her headdress and, oh, you know, this, her armor plates and stuff like that. I didn't want any of that. No actual metal here. I wanted everything to have a more organic mm -hmm. or, or magical feel, right, for mm -hmm. the sort of consistency of the nature of the piece. Yeah, that's certainly a good choice. Yeah, I agree. Metal just has such a hard feeling to it. It's, it changes the composition a lot. Anywho, there you go. Um, so that was Ilario, and I love her, and she's great. So <laughs> she was a very fun model of paint. And yeah, it was great. I hope we get more kits like her in the time to come. All right, so let's move on. Let's talk about, so 10 Dead Gods and uh, the Varengard. So, okay, well, uh, the first thing we're going to talk about with this is, is metals. Metal! Indeed. It's everywhere on this guy. So he's gone with a real pale gold and, and silver combo. And um, I would say throughout overall, it's not inappropriate. Like like exactly the opposite from what we were just talking about with Alariel. This is exactly the place where you want to slather lots of metal and then do it on purpose. Um, I think the, uh, the critique that I would have about it, though, is the delineation between what is silver and what is gold. And, uh, and those two colors seem to just wash over one another a little bit. A small part of that is the focus of the photography, but but I think even even if it was in, in sharp focus, I think we'd still be able to see that there, what I mean. Um, so I think the approach that I would have done is gone a little bit darker in the gold to look deeper color in that, to delineate. Um, and then also making a little bit of extra effort to do a wash in those transition spots. Right. So we, so when we look at this one, for example, his greaves on his legs, uh, the barding on the armor, all has kind of got some gold framework on the, on the main silver. And I think when you look at that more closely, you see that it is gold and not silver, but, but maybe not gold enough, I guess is the way to put it. Um, as far as other composition things that I like about this is he's obviously not done a regular horse underneath there. He's done some kind of magma, uh, some, some hot magma steed of hell steed of some kind of nature. Um, and going with the warm colors on that 
is is great, I think, and he does some balancing with the tufts of hair coming off the top of the knights as well, and the tabards that flow down, uh, at least on a couple of them. He's got the one here that's done in green, which seems out of place with the rest of it. But uh, I guess he's looking for some variants to identify his models and what the motivation was from there. But I think I would have preferred if you had stayed orange with those tabards that are draping down as well for the sake of the rest, the rest of the model. There you go. That's what I have to say about that. I think uh, Kieran really hit the major points here um, concerning the metals, especially. I've got a quick point that's not about the actual composition of the model, <clears throat> but rather about photography. Um, one thing I noticed as I look at this picture here is your light source is coming from uh, behind the model in a way that's creating some shadows in the front in the foreground. And when you're thinking about putting it up, I see that you took our advice about, uh, you know, using that background, which is great, but I think you want to push this model back uh, toward the, um, the, the cover of the book that sticks up and you want to angle it so that the light is coming toward the model to the, toward the front of the model. And that's going to really brighten it up because it's possible that these metals look a little bit better in the right light too. So um, we're trying to mm -hmm. critique you as accurately as possible. And, and uh, so help us out with thinking a little bit about light sourcing and the direction of the light. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would agree. And Vince is going to tell you to tidy up the base. So I'll save him the breath. <laughs> <laughs> you have read my mind. Yeah. The two things that, yes, I agree totally on the lighting I indirect lighting. We, with, with true metals, you can't point a light directly at the metal or it's going to just like explode. So you have to diffuse your light by being indirect with it, bouncing it off something else or diffusing it with like a, a cloth or a, thin sheet of paper or whatever something you know um but I, my my thought is there's one color too many on every one of these models um like the first guy i don't need the blue and i'd love to see a little more of the orange and red worked up into the model itself the horse looks fine i, I love fiery horse um on this on on and then like over here i think you were pointing out like this sort of light puke green or whatever it yeah. is like the baby puke green uh yeah, that's one that stood out for me yeah i just it like I feel like two of these have one color too many, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, overall, yeah, staying, oh, go ahead. Yeah, staying staying with the oranges is, is, is my point on on those kinds of extra accents. Yep, absolutely, and because I think they, like I said, I thought it, it, my initial question to him was, are they are they Nurgle? And he said, yeah. Well, they they look Nurgly enough with the very like blighted silver and blighted gold, which I'm okay with you don't need to push it more with, with even more of those tones. I think it, it already captured it pretty well as it was. Um, yeah. All right. Good stuff. Let's get some lighting and we'll, we're, we're going to be rock and roll. Cause I think you've got a good unit there for sure. Um, all right. Let's move on to Victor case and the Zangors uh, who are getting their own box. Like right now you can go get it. Yeah. And I think that you can make the age Sigmar ones in that box too. If you don't give them pistols. That is correct. You get a okay. separate you get a separate sprue in there that is the fantasy weapons. Yeah, well, it's people like Victor who are making me want to go out and buy some because <laughs> uh, these look really really sharp, Victor. Um, as do most of your models that you've submitted to the PMP. So I really like the color composition here. Um, I really like that that these are colorful and they're in keeping with all the Zinch models that we reviewed, uh, you know, an hour or two ago uh, when we did the first half of the show. Yes. Um, <laughs> so you know similar comments that we've given you before about you know really quality uh, brushwork and and good color selection if i had to challenge you a little bit i'd say well, one thing that i was looking at is so like if i look at the the hooves and the beak of the model on the left here um yeah so if the hooves and the beak of this model here to me look like they haven't been highlighted up enough and then if we go over to that group shot they look kind of like a matte brown if we go to the group shot, you can see the, the model on the left here looks like it's highlighted quite well with a, I guess you, you blended in some gray. So it looks a little bit drab compared to the rest of the model, but that's probably in your intention because you don't want to distract attention from the, uh, the pink and the blue and so on. But, and possibly this is lighting, but I don't know why the model on the right, the hooves look like they haven't been highlighted up. Um, I, so if that's a little mistake there, you might want to go back and, and, and touch it up. But again, it's possibly the light. One other thing that I really want to compliment, though, before hearing what um, Vince and Kieran have to say about these really nice-looking models is I like the gemstones quite a bit. Um, 
there are a few of them scattered throughout and you want the uh, the extra mile to even put in the light of the point of reflection in the upper left hand corner of these gems uh, which is a really nice touch and uh, it takes these models up uh, one step further than than your average your average model so um, I really like them overall and I'm you could see if you ever take up a Zinch project beyond just the silver tower box, because I think you could have a really nice looking army if you went all the way with it. Mm. Yeah, I got nothing else to add aside from my uh, my marvel at uh, Victor's continued work. Um, I know that uh, last month we commented that Victor got some got some play in the uh, in the White Dwarf publication yeah. and on GW sites. I, I, you know, I think he's probably less than a year away from doing box art for them. Yeah, <laughs> I'm. I'm, I'm with bold, that. I'm going to boldly put that out there right now. Hey, I, I that I, I support that completely. Absolutely, I think I think Victor's would sign him up for the heavy metal team. He's got my vote. Yeah. Good stuff. All right, well, let's uh, move on. Okay, so let's see. Coming up here. Um, okay, so why don't I take John's work here? Um, with his his uh, custom flesh column, and then uh, uh, let's see, Jeff, if you want to take Tom Stevens' uh, Necromunda gang, and uh, uh, Kieran, why don't you take Casualty's uh, Plague Bearers for his Nurgle army? Will do. All right. So I know John's working on a little project. He's working on a um, on actually making some miniatures of his own. So this is a rather horrific situation going on here. Um, with the little goop clay people coming up out. Um, that's really disturbing. Uh, yeah, so I, I think this is good. I think my, like, I like the model, and you've got some good differentiation in the in the muscle tone. I think part of my, my issue is it feels like it just needs to be smoothed out a little. Um, like, some of your transitions are a little rough. Um, I think the eyes are what really jump out at me. I'm not sure what's going on there with the eyes. Um, I feel like those need to be much more like well defined. Um, it kind of just feels like paint got on them. Um, and whereas, and the eyes are always going to be a focal point of a big model like this. Like I wouldn't notice the lack of like, once I notice the eyes, I start looking around for the other things. Um, so it's definitely a really interesting model and super crazy. Um, I just feel like in the areas like along here where we've done this sort of, hatching this uh, method to, to get some highlights in there. I think like a final glaze would have really brought all that together. I think it's probably my answer. Uh, gentlemen, any other thoughts there? Well, uh, I'm, I'm mildly disturbed by it, I guess is my answer. Sure. I think we can all agree on that. <laughs> um, I think for the effect of what he, what John describes on here is this thing's rising out of a pool of blood. Um, I think to really sell me on the idea that it's a pool of blood and not just a, a disc that's also red like them. Um, you have to put some depth in there, find some way to, if you got to build up the, the rim edge or something like that, and then do your, your gloss effect on there. There's gotta be some depth, I think where it's coming up over the feet, perhaps that'd be something I'd add, I suppose. Yeah. And I, I think if you want to sell the horror of it all, I think if you wanted to take that even further and, and uh, use some water effects and, and a little bit of sculpting, it would be interesting to see like uh, a little ripple dragging behind uh, where, cause this guy is clearly like, you know, stumbling and, uh, and lurching through this space. So the fact that the, as you say, there's, there's, there's little depth to the pool and also there's no action on it. Um, so that, that kind of makes it look a little two dimensional next to this really, you know, dynamic uh, 3d model. Yep. That's... I agree. Yeah. All right, let's move on. So next up, we've got the old Necromunda gang. And uh, as Tom says, he, he did this Necromunda gang for his dad, Andover Plumbing, another member. It's a, it's a family affair here in the PMP. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Um, so he said in his, in his intro uh, about these Dalak Deloc? I call him Deloc. I'm not sure if that's the correct pronunciation, but uh, anyhow, these Necromunda gangers, he said that he could have gone the extra mile with some highlighting and on the cloth and the flesh and, and uh, 
goggles and so on. And so he's, he's well aware that he could take them to the next step. So Tom, I think I would agree. Yeah. If you wanted to go beyond tabletop standard, you know exactly what to do. So I just want to take a couple of uh, uh, moments here to admire the, the quality of the gang as a whole. I think that the color scheme is nice and simple. Uh, and it actually, the fact that you use the neutral cloth color and the neutral flesh tone, and then you have the silver for the gun, it really makes any areas where you've done something special with the metal or with the, uh, the equipment that they're holding, it makes it really stick out uh, nicely. So that, that's really important in a game like Necromunda where special weapons and knowing positions of them is really key. So it's functional and it's also visually interesting. Uh, one critique I give you beyond just your, uh, your highlighting advice that you already gave yourself, well, I've really got two things. One is I'd be a little bit more careful with the pooling when you wash the cloth. I know you're trying to do something kind of quick and dirty there, but not letting the, the wash pool up too much in those recesses, something we talked about a few times in the show already. And there are a couple of areas here where you can see that happening. So, um, you know, be a little cautious with that. Second thing is there's the, that power. Yeah, there, there's some good examples Vince is pointing out there. Um, that, that power weapon, the force weapon uh, that the guy in this, yeah, there he is right in the center that he's holding. For some reason, that's that's striking me as a little bit off. I know that you're trying to make it look like a glowing force weapon, but maybe the contrast needs to be a little bit starker. You need a little bit more darkness in the recesses there to really sell that. But it looks a little bit off to me, almost like fake. Um, and which is weird because the rest of the gang looks so gritty and and uh, realistic. So you might want to consider your method there. As I say, you could you could bump up the contrast by applying you know more of the darker colors in the recesses. Uh, or you can do more object source lighting where it's kind of glowing off of it, uh, and and which is kind of what's happening on the handle there. But then if it's if it's extending down to the handle, it would be extending onto the head and the hand and some of the other areas as well. So thinking through that a little bit, if you want to spend a little more time in the future doing that sort of thing, might go a long way for you. There's one other thing that I wanted to point out that I saw in one of these pictures. So Vince, I'm gonna ask you to move around a little bit. It was like uh, the back pack of one of the guys okay. that looked really reddish um that i thought looked really cool maybe it's, it's there. Yeah, it's yes. second, i think it's the second last frame there there you go i love this metal color it's almost like a like a pinkish red silver uh man i i just want to point out that i think that looks really really awesome especially with the caution uh yellow copper is the word you're looking for copper yeah yeah it's kind of coppery but it's even more pink than that than I than I typically associate with copper. But yeah, no, but but it's copperish, yes. So anyhow, uh, this is just to point out that if you're doing a project in the future, especially a Necromunda project, I think emphasizing that color could be really cool uh, throughout an entire gang or entire 40k little patrol or whatever you're doing. So keep that in mind. Um, so one thing we that we, I don't think we do enough on the show is point out like, hey, that's awesome. You should take that and run with it in the future at some point. So I, I recommend that two thumbs up if you uh, want to make make that a, a design choice for uh, an army. I especially like that he's done the uh, the very typical Necromunda hazard stripes on there. Well. Yeah, Absolutely. yellow and black. It's cool. To Necromunda, for sure. Well, as we all know with a flamethrower, the tank itself is going to eventually get hit and you're going to get blown up. So yeah. um, hazard those hazard stripes seem very appropriate. No, I agree. I agree with everything you said, Jeff. The, the, the power weapon call is a good deal, and I, I do think it's contrast. you got to have the darks to make the lights mean anything. Mm -hmm. But overall, very cool. And, you know, here's here's one thing I'll say. Like, there is nothing wrong with speed painting and, and just doing a, a simpler job with stuff. Um, I think that's completely valid. And I think that the most important thing you can do when you're doing a, 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 a sort of speed paint is clean painting, Right. You want the job to look, it doesn't like, instead of going into high contrast and all this kind of stuff, just get your colors down, get some minor, minor uh, tonal variation and keep it clean. And that's, what's really going to make that speed paint look great. All right. For sure. All right. Good stuff. Kieran, any other thoughts before we move on? Um, no, I think that, uh, that Tom, if you're doing this for your dad and if you really love your dad, <laughs> you'll go do those little extras <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm teasing you tom of course but uh but there you go you know g it. ambulance service watches the show too so you're really sticking it to them i like it all right <laughs> <laughs>
Yes. So let's let's talk about some some holiday. Some let's, let, yes, let's bring in the holiday spirit with some Christmas plague bearers here. <laughs> what makes you say they're Christmas plague bearers? Uh, I would like to direct your Just attention. Because they're red and green. No, to this guy right oh, here. He's got a Santa hat. He has his Santa hat first. on. He's ready to bring this good one. little gifts to all the boys and girls. Oh, boy. So when we were talking an hour or two ago, wasn't there the, the conversation we were having about? Because he, he posted a couple pictures like, do should I go the Christmas route? Should I not? Yes, yeah, yeah. So right. that's that's right. That's yeah. so we've addressed that already. Yes. I'm with you now. Gotcha. Well, there's there's several things that I like about this uh, that that Vince will hate, and that is the blood and gore. Um, it's the exposed buboes that are glossy and and seeping sores. Uh, those are really nailed correctly. I don't know if that's the right word, <laughs> correctly, but uh, it certainly seems proper to me the way that the way I would imagine it would look. Um, so a couple other things to comment about, though, is I actually quite like the heavy, heavy snow that's on the bases, aside from the, you know, the usual clean up those bases and don't make them look messy around the rims. But, but the heaviness of the snow, uh, I kind of like it, actually. And there's a few bits of, you know, old grass that's, that's tired and yellow that are poking its way through. So the bases are visually interesting to me. Um, on the contrary, though, the snow that you've carried over onto the banner bear, which I think you'll see a little bit better in the next frame. If you want to flip to it, Vince. Um, that's too heavy up there, right? Like, unless that was just sitting in the snow for the past snowfall, and he's only just a few seconds ago picked it up to hold it vertical, uh, that's, that's just too heavy. There wouldn't be as much on there. So maybe that's – I back off on that one, I think, a little bit. Um, and then as far as extra commentary that I might uh, have you do a little bit differently or, or think about doing differently is you've done these dark rotted horns on all these plague bearers across, which is, I think, a fine choice, to be honest with you. Um, but still, like all other horns that we've talked about in the past, it has to have a bit of transition. You've done some transition on the back of that, uh, uh, of the Blight King on the horns that are there. But, but I understand that's a different style of horn than what you're trying to portray on the plague bearers themselves. But I still think it needs a transition color in there. And that might be going from a sort of a putrid brown before you eventually get black towards the tips. So uh, see, see what you think about that. Give it, give it a try. And, and I think that it'll give you a delineation between flesh and, and horn. Uh, but also be more convincing as it sort of transitions between, you know, it's a dying. I, I imagine what you're doing is you're, you're doing a sort of a dying extension of the horn as it goes away and it turns to black, but it would have some life right in there at the root. I, I you, you nailed exactly what I was going to say. Like my two big ones were the, the snow on that thing and the horns needing a little bit of variation. So there you go. I yeah. totally agree. Like the, I, and I also just want to also give my positive assent to the fact that you nailed like the blood effects and the buboes and that kind of stuff. I, I think that looks really good. There's a lot of variation under that blood. So that yeah. carried through very yes. well. Yeah. I'd say next time you're thinking about to echo Kieran's point about the snow. Um, the next time you're thinking about where to apply snow on a model, that's not the base, or even if you're thinking about the base, just go into Google images and type in, you know, winter scene or like winter thaw or something like that and see where the snow remains uh, or like, you know, freshly fallen snow or just type in a term like that. And you'll see that you typically want to find it. It's going to gather in the recesses and it's going to harden mm. in there. So like the insides of that banner might have a little bit of snow that kind of stick stuck in when the wind blew it in. And so thinking about that a little bit, that it's more likely to be in the recesses than in the most, you know, um, protruding areas. Yeah, that's probably right. I agree. Yeah, I, I think it's just too heavy on there is all. Well. Yeah. All Good right. Call. And more Christmas hats. Okay, moving on. <laughs> oh, we've got some fun ones here. Oh, boy, oh, boy, do we have some fun ones here. Um, I'll tell you what. I know I want to talk about Steve's, okay, um, because I, I love some things that are going on in this. Um and some of these are some older models that he just kind of brought up and had finished up for blood and glory. Um, but uh, let's let how, who let's say Kieran, do you want skeleton flowers, a wonderful ogre cheerleader here? Uh, and, actually, I have some things I want to say about Marok's uh, Marok's things. So, okay. So that's perfect. Yeah. I want this. I want that nasty, nasty ogre cheerleader. There you go. That's <laughs> of course. 
how could I not give a skeleton piece to, to Jeff? You're right. Let's 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 break this up correctly. All right. So let's start with skeleton flower and uh, and and this this little beauty. Uh, as I said during the budget of Sigmar review, she's a beauty. She's one in a million girls. All right, take it away. <laughs> oh God. So I'm actually painting a Blood Bowl ogre team from like 1987, 88, 89. So it's as old as me. Uh, and uh, man, this is a later release though than those original ones. But still real, real weird. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's what that is. Again, around that. So I think that Skeleton's usual technique is on full display here. And I think it comes out really well. Um, I love the pom pom, especially. I mean, that that really, um, you know, evokes your paint scheme, and you've done a great job of tying that pink collar in in several places, from the, um, you know, the laces on the shoes to the uh, strap on the, or the the um, the wrappings on the club and and the uh, pom pom itself in the skirt looks really good. Oh, and actually, also the now that I look a little closer, the bottom lip too um, ties in nicely. Um, mm -hmm. So what can I say uh, to, to try to push you a little further? I would say that I, I like the striations on this model in most of the places. Um, I think it looks good on the, on the muscles. It looks kind of ripped, uh, which is what you're going for there. But if we flip around to, we flip around to see the, uh, the back. So yeah, on, the, on that big surface of the back, it, it looks a little bit off to me. I don't know... I think it might be honestly because the contrast is a little bit, a little bit high there, going from that really dark brown to um, to the white. So I, I tend to like it. And so, like, if we look at the the arm, the right arm that's raised up in the air, see, I think there it looks quite good. But then on that large flat surface at the back, it it looks a little bit off. So. I don't exactly know what the remedy there is because, you know, if you're painting in that style, you're going to do it consistently throughout. Mm -hmm. Possibly you could go with just that, um, you know, the flesh, the mid-tone flesh color throughout the entire thing and then concentrate the, the line highlighting more on the, um, on the top of the back than on the bottom. But I don't really know. Um, do you guys have, have some thoughts on this? Um, I might, I might offer that he like this is the the style that he does. So we're not gonna we're not gonna change the style, nor should we, because it's wonderful. Right. But I think to to achieve what what I think you're getting at, Jeff, is those striations and banding that he does um, could maybe be on the bigger, brighter, and more open places, be a wider band. Mm. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So it's okay. not as sharp striping, but wider striping. But he can still do that transition of color to uh, to achieve the effect that he's that he's become so good at. You know what? And here's an example of that. If we look at the skirt on the bottom, no, right there, yeah, in this image. So in the darker mm -hmm. colors, you, you see those wider bands there than there are on the top and the flesh. Yep, yeah. I, I think you're dead on. I think we just need some wider areas where it does where the strokes don't feel as thin. Like it's you're exactly right. It's 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 a style. So like saying, well, just glaze over it and smooth this all out. That's not the right answer because then it would look weird compared to the the rest of it, right? So yeah. I but I think you're exactly right. The answer is much like down here where the bands go wider. You can actually see them down here rather large. I think it's the same thing here where just like two or three of these need to get brought together, right? Basically. So you've yeah. got these larger striations. Yeah, I think so. And just to wrap things up for you, Skeleton, in your introduction, you mentioned that you put some colors into the rocks that didn't quite come out in the photographs. But um, so I'd say, you know, great stuff there too. Uh, and I'm imagining you mixed in some of those green colors that you used for the clump foliage uh, to, to tie that in. So I imagine in person that that really looks pleasing in a way that doesn't exactly come across in the photo mm -hmm. not that it looks strange in the photo just that you know, we can't quite see exactly what you're seeing there but yeah i think you're definitely right on the green like if when i i leaned way into my monitor and you can see the green here mm -hmm. here all under here like so he's, he's definitely oh, yeah. doing it if yep. you look like really i had to like lean way in which is not it's not that's not a question of his painting the camera's going to be very hard pressed to capture a small variation like that which is what you want it to be you want it to be you know very subtle yeah, but overall, really, really cool, and I love your style as always. Absolutely. All right. So Steve Wren, as he mentioned, he uh, he 
Blood and Glory, which he ended up taking best uh, uh, best uh, appearance at, best painted, whatever you want to say. So, grats, Steve. Um, but let's take a look here at this big boy. Got the big, the big uh, frosty out here. I know, Kieran, you're also a fan of the uh, Feni. I am. That's true. Um, so, so this really breaks out to three separate pieces, right? Um, so, so let's talk about the first one here. I'm going to take these quickly in turn. Um, my problem with this one is uh, the assassin kind of gets lost in the overall image, which I guess is maybe the point he's supposed to be um, kind of blending in and because he's an assassin. Um, I'm not sure why he's assassinating this random zombie. I don't know that this guy poses any threat to this guy. Um, but what I'll say is I'm not sure about the red being here. Like that zombie is so bright, so bright. Um, whereas I feel like if he's really a zombie and this is really the snow, if you leave, you know, like clothing out in snow and just let it sit there for a while and bake, the color gets knocked out of it fast because it gets sun washed and water bleached, like sun bleached and water washed. There we go. Really, I switched those around really fast, right? So I feel like what would have worked here is a lighter tone, desaturated red um, to really like knock a lot of the vibrancy out of this um, and even maybe lightening the assassin some to white because you want this fun scene down here. Honestly, I think kind of minimized. This is the focus of the model, right? Like this is what matters. This guy and his bird. And this guy is very bright. All this bright gold, his white cape, this Frosty's, you know, ridge line. Um, so I think this needs to be the focus. This is an, a discovery, right? Like when you think about the composition, what should happen is my eyes are immediately drawn here. And then, and then as I sweep around the model, which I should do based on the edge lines of the wing positioning, because you've got this white highlight and snowflakes tracing me down the wing. What I should do is I should look and go, oh, this is some neat stuff. And then as my eye sweeps around here, I should go, oh, wait, oh, what's this going on down here? Oh, ho, ho. There's more to discover, right? And and the problem is when I look at this now from a distance, I just like, blah, that guy's there. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about this thing. This wonderful, wonderful thing here. Let me get to the, here we go. I love this picture. Um, I have very few things to say about this um, other than I love it. Like, I don't, I have nothing bad to say about it. What a wonderful use of the Sisters of Sigmar. What an incredible steam tank conversion. Um, I love the matriarch driving this. I love the white marble. Very subtle white marbling. Um, I would have liked to see maybe a few thinner, stronger black lines. Not like black, black. Just slightly deeper, more intense lines. Just a few here and there, maybe throughout this. But that's minimal. Um, overall... This is one of my favorite pieces I've ever seen you do. Wonderful conversion. Your metals look pretty solid. You got a lot of variation in there. I think we could push it with some of these steels just a little more. Um, but for the most part, I love everything about this. What a ridiculously good conversion. I love those sisters. Um, it's almost like a war wagon-y type feel. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like, God, it's, it's really great. Um, is that what he's trying to get out of it? I... I mean, I think it's just, you know, the steam tank. I think he's going for his version of whichever one of the steam tanks had a war wagon on top of it. There was a, like, classically of the 12 steam tanks, one of them had been converted to have a war wagon on top of it. I don't remember which, what the name of that one was, but, you know, I, I, I would guess that's what he's making an allusion to. Gotcha. Uh, let me see if I can find, and then finally, let's talk about this big thing with this, these guys dragging this circle around. I think this is supposed to be as Luminarchy said. Is that right? Or or is Celestial Huracanum one of the two? Um, yeah, let's see. Um, yeah, where is it here? Uh, Celestial Huracanum. I have a Celestial okay. Huracanum from the, for the Order Army built from the Circle of Orboros Battle Engine, which is um, Privateer Press. Right, yeah, yeah. So yeah, Huracanum. Um, mm. This is a, a fun thing. It's obviously quite big. Like, like I can look and see just how big this thing is because I know the size of that miniature. Um, this thing ain't small. Um, and, and I like most of what you're doing. I think the one thing I'd like to see is a little bit more variation in this stone um, kind of around. You've got some really nice variation in this gold. Let me just point that out. Like I've, well, I've kind of, we've talked before or, you know, about Steve doing some more variation in your metals and places. Here, you really nail that. 
like look at this gold transition from this very very reflective down to this very very dull i mean both of these places i really love the light catch um yep. that's really good i think if you were going to take this even farther i'd trace a line of light catch along the edge of this ridge and this ridge right so that if the light is hitting it or whatever it's mostly here and then catching on this edge catching on this edge but that's that's a minimal thing um overall i think the main thing that jumps out at me is the is the stone looks kind of samey compared to everything else which has all sorts of great variation in it uh, yeah. that might be just solved with doing some some edge highlighting on the on the major yeah bricks sure absolutely because there's lots of really hard edges here right like boy oh boy is this thing just a collection of edges <laughs> yeah uh but very cool conversion like that circle of orbor orboros oboros oboros orboros doesn't Orboros. matter it, uh, yeah it doesn't <laughs> doesn't matter it's a cool model um i love them pulling it i don't know if that's i don't know if he converted that in some way or if that's actually what it is i know there's a couple models in in uh war machine hordes that have like people pulling things around with chains so very cool great stuff steve all right maroc mm -hmm. well he's got two uh he's got two different models to look at here um this first one I think it was uh, he was trying to do it as a as a lizardman special character, isn't that right? There was some I, I seem an to old remember blood, back I believe. The day, there was some sort of famous Croxagore that was a celestial appearance, and I think that's the guy that he was trying to do here. Yeah, Akai. Gotcha. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but maybe I'm getting it wrong. I think he's naming Nakai the one that he gets to at the end there, because he says he's got two. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> names are not names are not important. What we're here to do is talk about painting toy soldiers. <laughs> yes. So so let's look at that. Okay. Well, what I want to say about this is the challenge of white has uh, has has come at you again. Um, this is a challenge for everybody. We've talked about the trials and tribulations of white. You have to be patient with it. You have to be ready to go through multiple layers. And anytime you do some. Uh, shading you have to do it very subtly um, and I think I'm pretty happy with this like if we get a shot of the spine of this guy you can see that he's got some some mauve purple there that works its way throughout goes down the tail and delineates between the scales because um, he's got very big scale plates on the back of this guy and then as we get to the side look and, and the shoulders it's got some smaller smaller scales and, and spiny scales, especially around the shoulders. And uh, it's the ones around the shoulders that I think could use a little bit more depth because they are in fact deeper, first off. Um, and especially that front on shot, you can see it just looks like nothing but white. Right. Because unfortunately that's all, that's all washed out. Some of that might be camera, but, um, but still, I think that, I still think that you can draw that, that shade highlight to, to give definition to those spiny scales, especially on the shoulders. They, I think they need some help to, to stand out and, and not look just like a sprayed white model from four feet away. Um, so, so that's my comment about this guy. I think that you got to be careful about it. And I know this is, this is not an easy ask what I'm asking you of, but to get back in there with that, uh, with that shade and, and sharpen those, and uh, delineate those scales, especially the spiny ones on the shoulders. That's why I ask. Uh, let me give you a full-on compliment about uh, about the the glorious um, expression that you've got in this guy's facial features, though. Like if you give that, if you get get shots of that, that I think there's a I think there's a, a head-on one that may or may not be in focus. Yeah, I don't think it's in focus well enough, but. Uh, but yeah, color and striation on the tongue is all there. The mouth is is really well done, and uh, and the eyes are really sharp on this one as well throughout this model. So that's that's the upside to this model is that face, and uh, and the expression that's on there is really well, really well portrayed. Um, one thing that I want to say just uh, just before we switch to look at this guy, let's go back to the last frame of of this fellow for a second. I want you to look at the gold throughout this on here and it turns out to be a very yellow gold um, 
and in some places I think could use a little bit more sharpening. And that's sort of what I want to talk about when we go to this next model. So, so think about this as we, as we look through the next ones. So you can flip ahead and we'll look at this guy. Um, and what I want to point out is on this model, as we flip through a couple of shots of it, we're talking about the gold. As Marok's gone to another little bit higher level of gold transition on that. Um, the most notably, again, on the spine of this guy is where the gold appears, but also on the breastplate. Um, so he's just gone to one other level of highlight on this gold. And I think that would be worth going back onto the Mackay model and doing there too. Um, but let's talk about the positives of this one. Um, very good delineation in the scales, like every scale on this guy, uh, right from his knuckles, right down to the tip of his tail is very sharply defined. And we go from dark almost to white as we go through that transition. Um, it all looks very smooth. There's nothing chalky about that. So the application of paint is really good throughout all the scales on this guy. Um, uh, you'll notice here, and it shouldn't be surprising to too many of us, that, that Marok has managed to be the genius of building a model out of, out of almost nothing and making it unique. He's done two head swaps with this in case, uh, in case the subtlety of flipping back and forth in the photos, you haven't noticed that. You can actually see the extra head down here on the ground. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so he's built it with a peg to go in there. Um, he's. You'll also notice on the forearm here that he's, he doesn't have it in any of the pictures, but he's obviously left that so that he can swap out some kind of shield or whatever other accoutrement is going to go along with this model in the future. Um, now, when we're looking at this head, if we pause on that one for a second, this head with all the headdress on it actually has a little bit more character in the way that the face is painted than the other head, I thought. So I think you really nailed it on this one. And that's, and so therefore I like this configuration that we're looking at right now better than the other head option. Took the words out of my mouth. Yep. hundred percent. Yep. So, uh, so yeah, that's what I got to say about that. Uh, I can only say I agree on everything. Um, and I agree with you totally on the scales. The, the second model just nails those scale delineations so well. I just want to quickly point out one very fun thing about this first model. I love the use of this basing mm -hmm. um, where he has him on the rock with like the sort of goopy, goopy goop water around him. That's very fun. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I had seen some of that green up top. I think you could have done that in this ball to kind of bring that up some. Also, Maroc, you highlighted the ball as though it were pointing straight up in the air and it's pointing sideways. Like this right here probably should be your light point and it should be swirling around that, assuming the ball is meant to be highlighted at its highest point because um, it's actually highlighted way over here on the side as though the light is coming in swoop, horizontal, which I don't think is what you're meaning to portray. So just a Good small thing. Good catch. Yeah. All right. Okay. Moving on. All right. Let's see. Uh, I'll take uh, I, I, I'll take uh, Victor's Dark Oath Barbarian. Uh, let's see. Kieran, you want to take uh, the the gun, the federal uh, gunslingers, the, the escaped convict gunslingers, and uh, Jeff, you want to take the big the big eagle? Sounds great. Sound good. All right. Uh, okay, so Victor with the Dark Oath Barbarian. Save this guy for last. I get that. I saved mine for last as well. Um, very well done on this. This is such a good model. Like For people who haven't painted this, seriously, go on a bit site and get yourself one of these just to paint it. I mean, I, if you have any love of painting great models, you'll love painting this model. I don't know what else to say about it. Um, it's the the muscle structure. He even has like a wonderful sneer on his face. Um, it's it's just a, such a well done model. Um, and Victor's done a lot of great things here. Again, as we've talked about it, you know, these are these are gaming pieces. They're meant to be used to play with, handled probably roughly by people who don't normally handle figs, because often you can have your family playing this with you. Um, but he's still done this to a to a very high level. Um, we talk a lot about bone, tonal variation in bone and striation, um, captured very well here, going all the way down into the red tones and such on the mouth of this creature. Um, so I like all of that very much. Um, I think... Uh, you know, we, we've talked before about these. I mean, there's, I'm sure even Victor knows there's some things he could do. He could probably smooth some stuff out a little bit. Um, but on the whole, I very much like how this came out. 
I would say one thing you could do if you want to go for the more simple take here on this sword, where you've kind of got just the edges highlighted, you know, more of the dry brushing style highlight. One thing you can do to still create some interest in it is put some scratches in the blade right across there. Um, and I think that would, with the lighter color, and I think that would, would uh, break up sort of the larger space of, of grayness in the middle. But overall, very cool. And a, uh, and a welcome addition to the, to the heroes there, I'm sure. All right. What an awesome model too. Isn't it? Uh, and Victor did it justice. It's, uh, it's so, it's one of my favorites of the past couple of years that GW's done. It's really pretty. Absolutely. As our, as our, uh, as, as my hero, the bard says, look at the muscularity. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I love that guy. <laughs> All right. I can't stop looking at the, at the skull kneecaps. Yeah. Those are great. It's such a nod to old school stuff too, from like eighties and nineties sculpts. Oh, like, totally. yeah, we'll just put skulls on the knees. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where have we not put skulls lately? Kneecaps. Yeah. Sure, seems good to me. Let's do it. Right. I like that he went to the trouble to kill two equally sized creatures to make sure that he had matching kneecap skulls. Like he yeah. thought about that. Yeah, it was you know that wasn't a, it was because <laughs> skulls aren't often exactly the same size. But this guy went to a lot of trouble. He hunted for a while. All right, let's talk about some convict gunslingers. Let's. Okay, so this is a uh, for uh, this is a Malifaux model for for the guild. Um, he's obviously been watching some TV lately. Orange is the new black is the is the convict colors of the of the new millennium, not those black and white stripe ones that they used to do on Alcatraz in the mid century. We moved on from that now. So <laughs> so this hot orange on here. Yeah. Um, um, so Will actually mentioned to me uh, this last week when we had him on the show that he is in the middle of an orange renaissance. Uh, yeah. He's loving <laughs> painting the color orange. So there you go. Well, I think on this one, your deepest, uh, obviously it's very striking. I think your deepest orange can be a bit darker. Um, I do like that you've come almost to yellow on the highlights. So you transitioned through there a, a fair bit, but I think your deepest folds can be, can be a mild bit darker. Um, and I don't know that there's, there's probably some washes that you, that you need to, to get into the red a little bit to achieve that. I don't think that the orange washes that I've encountered anyway, um, would make any difference from the base color that you've put down there. Um, but you probably have to get into a little bit of red or, um, uh, I, I've been doing some orange on my, on my dwarfs lately and I've used the crimson one that Games Workshop does. And, uh, and it seems to fit okay. It doesn't end up looking bright red or too sharp. So that's been working for me. Um, moving up top of the model, uh, obviously the, the next big feature of this model is, uh, is flesh tone. So you've done a good job of, uh, of showing off this guy's prison physique. He's been doing nothing but, uh, nothing but push-ups and sit-ups in his cell for, for probably a couple of years. So he's got some good definition there. There is, however, a couple of spots where the wash has stayed a little bit heavy. Uh, like right under the pectoral, it stayed a little bit heavy and it looks glossy as well. And then there's a couple of spots on the arms where that looks similar. And, and you get a bit of a gloss shine on a place that otherwise wouldn't be there. Um, so I guess you have to be willing to, uh, to, to just maybe back off a little bit on that. Uh, but what you can do on the other side, I think, Will, is that you can move into one more highlight layer on some selective spaces of the torso. So across the tops of the pectorals, uh, the top angles of the abs, and of course the shoulders and, and biceps, you can go into a slightly lighter flesh tone on those. And therefore, you don't have to be washing as dark in other places because your lighter tone will make your sort of middle tone and darker tones look darker than having to force wash to make that happen. So that's what I'd say about that. And uh, I want to add one last thing. And that is about the eyes. The eyes are, are okay. I think that, uh, you know, eyes are always a tricky thing and we all have to appreciate that these models are pretty slender. Um, like for those of you that are used to G dub scale models, um, these Malifaux models are a little bit, more slender and, and more subtle. So getting into the eyes at all is sometimes a tough thing to do, but if you have the confidence to do it, well, 
do a little bit of a darker underlining on the bottom of the eye and therefore it doesn't look at, it won't look as round and if it connects a little bit with the pupil or the or what would be the iris of this model then i then i think that i will that one uh i guess it's his right eye when when we're looking at the model itself um looks a little bit googly otherwise i so i think that I think Kieran's advice there on all counts is, is totally uh, on point. Uh, I've got two little things to add um, to you, Will, here. And I think, this, as Kieran suggests, this model looks really cool. Um, one thing is the placement of the bricks on the base. Uh, if we're thinking about where this model is standing, you know, it looks as though it can't take a step without kicking the bricks. And so I'm, I'm wondering about the story there and, and the exact placement. And, and, and what the thought is uh, there. It looks like he's walked right up to some bricks and stopped and taken aim with his pistol. And uh, so it looks a little strange to my eye. And secondly, I wonder if the, it wouldn't look a little bit cooler if the bricks were white instead of red. I'm not suggesting you change these on the model now. I'm just saying, thinking about this moving forward. To my eye, the, the red and the orange and the flesh color are all really similar uh, warm colors. And um, so I think... You know, if you were to if you were to paint them like a gray and then add gray to a couple other points of the model, um, you know, like maybe a piece of the gun or the hair or something like that, it might be um, an interesting thing. Or the tie on the pants could be could be possibly white as well. But um, that's just my two cents. Uh, you know, I think it looks like a really cool model overall, but it's two things that struck me as I was looking at it. I think if you do the tie on the pants, then he turns into a kung fu master. <laughs> That's possible, yeah. Indeed. I would say, by the way, if you're looking for a deeper shadow in that orange, um, a really good trick is just to mix a little bit of a dark, desaturated blue shade or ink into your uh, into your orange, and that will give you uh, an orange shadow color. So huh. there you go. Good tip. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. So let's move on. Jacob Wallman the eagle eagle let the eagle so mm -hmm. like it's never so before okay um <laughs> i actually know someone who's related to john ashcroft so okay moving on uh well let me say jacob that uh my favorite part about this model as i view it is well i really like the the, the story you're telling i think that's pretty cool but my favorite part technically in terms of the way you've painted is um the feather application, the way that you painted this kind of like a bald eagle um, in that you've got the tail and the head in, in white and the rest of it brown. And, you know, that's a small little thing that, that the, the choices you made for the color application there, but I think it's it was a strong choice and, um, and it adds a little bit more realism to it. You know, I feel like that's an actual bird uh, you know, flying out and swooping down and bringing death to the ground. Um, so uh, thinking about this this scene itself, I'm, I'm a little confused by it in that you've got this high elf that's stabbing a marauder in the back. So apparently he's like infiltrated behind the enemy lines and the eagle swooped in at the same moment. Um, so I'm not sure exactly why that high elf would be behind the marauders unless it was riding the eagle got off or something like that. I'm not sure there, but it's pretty cool. You've got him, you know, stabbing that that other fellow uh, on the in the center of the model from this angle. But one the the part of it that really confuses me is like the torso that's being held in the claw. There you go in that in that picture. So I'm just confused as to how the model got ripped, or rather how the this this man, barbarian uh, marauder, got ripped apart and where his arm went and how that. I'm just confused as to what the story is there. And so when I see that, I'm thinking that that the model looks like. It should have legs and an arm unless those were mangled. And if they were, would they have been severed clean off? And if so, by what? So that's one thing that, I, that I'm thinking about there as I'm trying to piece together the story. So I get that this mall swooping down and the eagle is wreaking havoc on the unit. And I think that's totally cool. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to piece together the story a little bit more um, and trying to figure out what you're doing there. Having said that, um, I, I want to also compliment the fact that you said you wanted to add some static grass to the base and really bulk that out. I think that that'd look really nice if you added a little bit more of that, uh, a little bit more texture to 
to the base itself because you you spent all the time creating this diorama and converting and i think to leave the ground uh this flat it would be would be a, a travesty because um i think that's a really cool um scene that you're trying to display here so i'd go with static grass and maybe even another basing material as well to add a little bit more interest you know you already decided to go so above and beyond just building a great eagle <laughs> that you might as well go all out on the base as well um, so just to recap, uh, really like the way that you painted up the bird. I think, um, you know, the, the color placement there is good. I think the story that you're trying to tell here is, is really cool, except, you know, I'm a little bit confused as to, as to what's happening. Um, but overall, I think it's a, it's a cool model and I like the attempt and I'm impressed because you said you speed painted this and it's really good quality for just painting very quickly. Yeah, quite, quite a diorama scene, frankly, for a speed paint. That's what I'll say. That's an ambitious project yeah rarely do you see someone speed painting but also spending all that time to convert so <laughs> right yeah absolutely Kudos. so yeah good job okay very cool all right let's move on uh okay so uh let's see we've got we've got some more from tom stevens let's just take a look at this together as we saw sure. some of his necromunda gang earlier so we'll let's look at some more these are his uh goliaths yeah, more Goliaths. You can see we can see the continuation of the tats, uh, which, by the way, was another thing that I, I that um, Will could have done to break up all that flesh. You know, uh, uh, oh, yeah. on the on the convict would have been to have yeah. some prison tats, right? Um, yeah, so I, or teardrops, sure, anything. Yeah, yeah teardrops. Yes, for for all the people <laughs> they killed in in <laughs> weird nineteenth century alt world Victoria. Victorian yep. England, America, <laughs> whatever it is. Okay. Um, okay. So, but uh, I, I like the, the Mohawks look good. I'd like to see, I think the thing that jumps out at me the most is I'd love to see a little more variation in the Mohawks because really these, these Mohawks take dry brushing pretty well. So you could just do like a slightly lighter dry brush over the top and pick out a whole bunch and good to go. Um, I think that's probably the one thing that jumps out at me the most um, when on, I look at point, these guys on that point yep. real quick, Vince, I'm painting up, so I'm painting those blood bowl ogres and they have Mohawks too, many of them. And I'm doing like a, like a color mixed in. So mm -hmm. like here you've got red and you, it'd be kind of cool if you did gray in the center of the Mohawk too. Oh, like a stripe down the middle. Yeah. Like a stripe. Well, you could go down the middle. I was thinking horizontally in the middle section so that it's like, you know, three segments of the hair. Cause like, yep. you know, the Mohawk is clearly like a, like a fashion statement that these guys right, are going for. Sure, so sure, adding sure. some dye in there would make, would make sense. I dig that. <laughs> I dig that. Um, yeah. But if you go to a different color on here, where else do you like, like I, I'm not suggesting that you, Jeff, would go to a scorpion green or anything. <laughs> like that. Um, but then that means you got to find a different place to to balance that color in other other spots in this model. Well, if he did a blue gray, he could play off the pants color. Uh, like if those are in fact blue gray, so oh, okay. you yeah. know, like that kind of thing, or even that that um, bronze type color in the um, in the in the gun so something mm -hmm. not not metallic obviously but a brownish color that that looked like a similar hue you could do that to add a little bit more interest he doesn't have to i was just saying like in the future if you're thinking about doing mohawks and you want to get real weird with the necromunda stuff especially if they like re-release it and god i'm praying every night that darren latham is sculpting those models as we speak i would go mm -hmm. nuts if he did um so yeah just to think about mohawks i mean if you're going to get weird with it get real weird with it you know go all the way sure yeah. And uh, as far as tattoos or like, I mean, this looks like this looks more like my body paint than, than tattoo. Um, if uh, if anybody's got some thoughts about making them look like tattoos instead of body paint, uh, Vince, you might have something to say about glazing flesh tone over top of that. Too. Yeah. Can we yeah. zoom in on one, Vince, while you talk about it? Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, what and so what what's being I, I think what Kieran, you're putting your finger on is it's too solid, right? Like tats fade really fast. Like when you walk around in the world and you look at people with tattoos, really yeah. stop and, or if you have them yourself, really stop and look at them. And you'll see that they aren't solid colored because you're shedding skin cells. And even though that ink is way down in there, like especially over time, it tends to fade and your skin kind of comes through. And so the way that you replicate that is by taking your mid-tone flesh tone and covering over um your tats once they're on there to make it look like they faded now the more 
if this is a glaze and always you always go lighter than you think you should because you can put on another glaze really easy but you can't take off a glaze <laughs> okay um so very thin is your goal here um actually one of my most recent videos i i talked about this so if you want to see exactly what i mean you can go look at my recent like hobby cheating on tattoos and you know it's it's a very quick process um it's just an extra few seconds at the end of it and it can really really make all the difference in making it look more like a tat um you don't do that if it's war paint because yes war paint is the item uh that like you want it to be bright and way out there and not uh not in any way letting flesh show through except in like having hacks and chips out of it because it was unevenly applied so there's different mm -hmm. tactics um, but it's a solid color because it's directly on top of the skin yeah so that's the delineation i wanted to make as well is that war paint if that's indeed what tom is after here goes on top of the skin whereas tattoos go underneath the skin and therefore still have on the top side a, a fleshy orientation to it yep definitely the more I think deeply about flesh, the more I think about how, you know, flesh is, you're trying to get the color to come through the flesh in all, yes. in all flesh colorings, you know, purples and pinks or purples and reds and, and, and oranges. So yeah, it's, it's like a translucent membrane that covers those colors. Correct. Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, in almost all flesh painting, your last step is going to be flesh is going to be flesh glazes, right? Because what you're trying to capture is blood and veins and, the tattoos and, and a bunch of other stuff going on underneath your skin because your skin is translucent. Mm -hmm. We don't think of it like that, right? Because there's enough of it there you can't actually see through, but you know your skin is translucent and not opaque if you've ever held your hand up to a light. Yeah, the <laughs> right? sun. Yeah, you, exactly. yeah, or the sun. You can see light coming through your skin. So there you go. Okay. All right. So uh, let's see. So let's pick up here. Um, why don't I take uh, Ryan Easterling's uh, latest submission to the Chaos Court of Corcosa here. And then, uh, Kieran, if you want to take Dave Good in Theory Raymond's uh, submission here. He's got two of them, actually. Yeah. Um, so if you want to do both of those. And, and Jeff, are you okay with the uh, Yu Jing Infinity in the middle there? For sure. All right. Okay, so Ryan, this is we, we obviously said we had left, left off a few minutes ago or hour ago or whenever it was, whenever we are pretending like that was the case um, <laughs> with his other group. So this is his second unit for the budget of Sigmar. And this is a wonderful cursling conversion. Like I really like this by switching the head with this guy and having him like bleeding these tears of blood. Um, that's a pretty, pretty wonderful image. Um, and you can see this guy just kind of whispering these horrible things in his ear growing out of him. Um, Pretty, pretty gross. Um, now, I'll say a couple things about this. So let's let's see if we can find a good angle here. Um, here, we that we talk about letting the wash build up and stuff. It This needs to look like it's actually growing out of him. And because we had this big wash line build up here, now it just looks like it's, it's literally just stuck onto him. And we don't want that. We want this to look like a smooth, stretched, bruised flesh. Um, if you want to see about how to do bruises, you can watch the hobby cheating video that just came out most recently. Um, but the, like, so it looks like it's all connected there. I think that's the, the missing component here. Um, that being said, um, I, I very much love the, the concept of this piece and on the cursling, you've got some nice purple tones and stuff like that worked into the flesh. So you're going the right direction here, um, in your variation on the skin. Um, my only other thought is really with this sword, um, which I feel is kind of boring. Like this side of the model is so this like bright shock yellow. I'd love to see some more variation here coming down into like orange or something um, to, to kind of liven this up because um, this looks a little flat. Like all this has some nice variation and washes and stuff. And then it's just like, boom, big bird. Um, but this sword looks rather flat. What I'd love to see is if you've got this heat crack or heat star down here, or this chaos point down here, I would have loved to see some like lava cracks or something like that through the sword. And it's a relatively easy thing to do. Um, you just can trace white through and then you paint that white red and then you paint a thinner line of white and then you paint that white orange and it'll turn yellow 
and yada 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 and where your orange gets over the red it will blay it will glaze automatically and boom you've made lava just like that um and and i think like if those cracks were kind of moving through it it would help to balance out the very brightness going on on this side so there you go those are my thoughts uh gentlemen any other thoughts from you uh to, to add to what you said about that blade I, I agree with that and i think that he's kind of gone with obviously some sort of brimstone because he's got a little bit of orange coming through on some places there right but, but i certainly agree that it needs because of the way the other side of the model looks it needs more towards the orange and yellow it needs something more bold over there at least to the at least to the top half because there's another way that you can do that you can maybe transition dark to light as you go up the length of the blade there's another way to approach it yep right and end up and end up very bright yellow at the very peak of the blade absolutely yeah there could be a there, there's obviously yeah, I, I agree totally there's a couple different ways you go about it he could go like the uh omri's route right and have like a hot spot in the middle or something like he did with his stormcast like there's oh, yeah. Yeah. probably many different ways he could attack this um, but it, it just getting that hotter, uh, more intense light spot on that side of the model, I think, is the key. Yep. All right. Uh, like the book behind the picture, like the nice clean edge to the base. Mm -hmm. just, we're, we're nailing it. <laughs> he's doing his homework. Exactly. Now that's I, look. You got to nail the basics, and he's he's got them, got them down. All right. Let's take a look. I'll, I'll start on this one, uh, and then we'll jump over here. Does that, that sound okay? Like, I'll start with the, uh, the girl with the spear here. Kieran? Uh, sure. Okay, well, this is, uh, out of the two, I, I really like the real pale skin tone he's going on with here. Um, you can still see that there's some some pinks and red in the, in the deep recesses of that, but he's really come up to a very a very fair color and paleness to it. And, and I really quite like that. Um, even on the abdominal, um, he's gone almost to, almost to a white there on the cheekbones, the bridge of the nose, uh, fingertips, uh, all that's, all that's wonderfully done. And then he carries over some bold highlighting on the, uh, on all the cloth that she's got. So th from this frame, that's most notable uh, on her headdress as well as on the peaks and uh, the peaks of her boot greaves. I think that's what those are anyway. Um, so, so that really captures your attention and in this frame really well. Most of the rest of the model, of course, is just some, some brown tones and, uh, and very neutral colors, which make you just focus on the simplicity of the model. Uh, the blonde hair as well, I think, is done really well. You, you and caught what I was things. definitely going to comment on. No, yeah, like... Not yellow in there. That's great blonde hair. He did a great job. Yeah, so it goes through like a like a pale yellowish brown, um, but but it's still brown, and then moves through like the sort of you know bone or ivory colors, and and gets you gets you through it that way. Um, the idea that I gain from this and, and looking at it more closely is that the sort of ornate headdress that she's got on is trying to be the same material as what she's got on her forearm greaves and, 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 uh, and her shin greaves that also seems to be the same material as the spear tip, but yet also seems to be the same material as her bikini top. Right. And, uh, and the thing on her hair, I think there's some subtle difference that needs to be, that needs to be done there because a lot of those things are hard surfaces, but the bikini top is obviously a fabric surface. And that's where I think that it needs to appear maybe a little bit differently than the other two. Um, still needs to be in the same, it's, it's fine for it to be in the same sort of color spectrum. I'm not suggesting that it needs to be anything else, but, uh, but it may not be as reflective, I suppose, in some places on there, because you've done a high, uh, you know, a pretty, sh a pretty sharp reflection on that. Um, so that could soften up a little bit maybe and be toned down. Um, what else do I like about this? Uh, oh, one, one thing that I did notice, though, however, I guess as a, as a small critique, is it's especially noticeable on the right thigh mm -hmm. that some of that paint has, has sort of gone pebbly and, uh, and grainy. Now, and, and you see it a little bit on the abdomen as well, to be honest with you. So I don't know if that's the primer that you're using 
because in fact, when we flip over to Dave's next model, that becomes a little bit more obvious. And I wonder if it's the primer. Uh, and maybe let's flip to there now in case, you, unless okay. you guys have other things that you want to talk about with this. One before we go. No, because you, you hit the thing I was, you, you hit both things I was going to say. Like when we're doing different textures, you have to have different highlights. Metal moves to very sharp highlights, has very low colors, but cloth tends to be more flat. So if the bikini's like that, it shouldn't have the same traveling of, of contrast, right? Um, yeah. I've, I've got two really quick things before we move on to the next one. Sure. Uh, one, the plate, the place that you're putting the highlights is, is absolutely great. Um, you've, so you've nailed the exact location. I think if you sharpen up those lines a little bit, uh, cause some of them are a little bit wiggly. Um, it, it's going to ratchet you up one level of painting for sure. Um, and the other very minor thing is the bottom lip of the woman, uh, I think could have a little bit more red in it. I see that you've got some red there. It looks a little pinkish, but I think a little, just a glaze of of, uh, of red, just on the bottom lip, not the top lip, would um would also bring it a little uh bring it up a little bit. So and yeah. then everything Kieran said, hundred percent. Yeah, and with. my my final challenge, Dave, is this: do the eyes. Um, mm -hmm. like she's not. I I I know how Kingdom Death eyes are. Okay, and I I know that that you've got that recess. I know that's tough to get in there. I know that that's a hard paint do the eyes because it stands out like a sore thumb without those eyes done. And I guarantee you, if you're careful and you put in the time to get just a black line and then a white line and then a white dot, or here you go. I'll give you an even easier method. You ready? I'll make this super easy for you. Like here's, here's an alternative for everybody when you've got eye situations like this, where you can't get in there and do work. Okay. Here's what you're going to do. I should do a video on this, um, but I haven't yet. You're going to paint this whole recessed area black. Okay. Then you're going to take a light gray. Like if you have Vallejo model color, I would specifically use the color light gray. Okay. And <clears throat> it's a tricky name. Yeah, indeed. And you're going to, so let's imagine this is all black together. Are we all picturing it together? This is all black. Okay. I'm going to take my light gray and I'm going to push my brush in here and go to this corner. And then I'm going to, to put, this is all black. I'm going to push my brush in here and go to this corner. Okay. And what that's going to create is the effect that her pupils are here and here. And she's looking off this direction. Making your eyes off center is often an easy way to make sure they look more aligned because you know they're both up against the corner. And it, that would fit with this model. She's clearly pivoting her body and turning her head to look this direction. Mm -hmm. So the simple gray swatch it's so easy and I guarantee you it would completely change your perception of this model. Make a huge difference. And, it, and that's the much easier way to do eyes. Either way that you go for it, um, just you've got the brush control to do it. You've shown it on the other areas of the model. So yep. either of those two techniques, just try it. Don't be afraid. You can handle exactly. it. You can do it. And if you get a little overpaint, guess what? You still have pots of flesh tone. You can always clean it up. <laughs> <laughs> like, sure. <laughs> Unless you don't. Right. That, is, that was it. Last pot of flesh tone in the country. There we were, it was. So for those in the know, is this also a Kingdom Death model? I think he said, what did he say? I, I, like, I'm trying to think of it. I don't, tiny little TGG2. There you go. Yeah, okay. So this is Toughest Girls in the Galaxy 2. Yes. Okay. That's what I thought. All right. So... Again, the, the uh, attractive things about this is, uh, is the pale flesh tone. Uh, I think that's really good. Um, when we get to the face, though, I think that's where I want to I wanna talk about some, some things that we can do a little bit differently. In, in some places, we're, we're, we're too pale. So, so thinking back to the last model, you had some variation that built up to the cheekbone, whereas there's not enough transition of color onto those sharpest points of cheekbone and forehead. So there needs to be some darker points. Um, and I think you can maybe go a little bit darker just under the eyebrow for one. And if you can do a sort of a soft glazing um, underneath that bottom lip, and you can sort of barely see a little bit of edging to the cheekbone on this model from the front side, but you can probably see a little bit better from the side angle as well. If you were to draw down from there um, and delineate that face a little bit better, I think that that would be a big win. Um, 
the other thing that might be worth doing is I, I think that you, because you've used a lot of red otherwise on the ribbons is maybe what motivated you to do a, a heavy blush on the, on the lips. Um, but because of how pale the face is around that, um, it seems like it's, it's sticking out a little bit too much, Dave. Um, and so these other things about doing some kind of color transition in the face itself a little bit better might soften that up so that you can still leave it as is. But when you reframe it around there, I think it'll look more natural. Um, mm -hmm. give me, get, let's, uh, let's see the, the next shot, Vince, if we can, and see if there's anything else to talk about on there. Yeah. So the feature from this one would be the hair. Um, you went further on your blonde hair on the last one, which I really liked, and maybe I'd encourage you to do the same on this one. Um, you just, it, it appears to me that you use the same techniques on doing the hair, but just stopped uh, a couple of stages short of going into that next blonde highlight color. Yep. So, uh, so give that a go. I, I hope you would give it a try. So yeah, I have, no. I have a, I have a supposition on this model. Cause I think this is where we really see like the chalkiness, the pittedness coming into the paint. Okay. Yeah. So there are three potential suspects here in this crime. If we're, if we're going to line up the usual suspects, uh, you know, style. Okay. Then try and try to find our Kaiser Soze. Um, then suspect one is primer, too thick primer that, that get that, you know, kind of, chalked up like doing it in high humidity or or you know in cold temperatures or anything like that all those are possibilities um two pain is too thick out of the pot that could have also caused this three since this is a tgg2 model um tgg2 models are which i love and are beautiful casts but they are famous for having more mold release on them than any other model i have ever seen in the history of models it is beyond imagination the amount of mold release on them you have to like you have to scrub them with dish soap scrub like with a, with a brush um, to get that off. And if you don't like, a tooth like using, yeah, a like, toothbrush? yes, like a toothbrush. That is exactly what I use. I actually use like a micro cleaner, like the same thing I use to clean my airbrush. I dump them in there with simple green and let it run for like mm -hmm. 10 minutes to get it off. Um, but anyway, um, if you don't get rid of that cleaner, what will happen when you put paint on is it will evaporate and dry and shrink, right? And it will cause, because it's shrinking under the paint, it starts pulling the paint together and you get this pittedness. I don't know for sure that's what happened here, but I have seen that happen on one of my own models that I thought I had cleaned well enough. Guess what? I didn't. Surprise. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Mm, that is a good public service announcement. The mold release. <laughs> yeah. Good. They are, it is enough that when you pick them up before clean them, there is, it, it, it your hands get greasy. Oh, wow. Well. That's, That's a lot. So, but I agree with all your points, Kieran. So. Yeah. All right, then. Let's move on. All right. Let's talk about some infinity, some Yujing. Yeah. So, um, Chris, let me start by saying that I think that, choosing orange and blue opposites on the color wheel uh, was really a, an excellent paint scheme uh, to use here. I, I don't know these models and I don't know Infinity very well, but I can say that I I don't believe I've seen many people painting up Infinity models in these colors. Uh, and I really like what you've done with them. Usually I see like uh, gray or blue uh, oh. or white. And uh, so this striking contrast is really nice. It's the difference between Panos and Yujing, by the way, is what you're seeing there. Panos oh, is blue. it? Yeah. Gotcha. All right, cool. So anyhow, um, and what I really like about the way you've painted this orange is that you you made good use of the color wheel. You didn't add white to the orange. Um, you didn't even add like a bleach bone color. You went from a, a really rich, deep orange and even brown in the recesses to a d deep, uh, rich orange and then a yellow uh, that you mixed in progressively, which blended up nicely into the uh, the primary color that you see here, the uh, orange on this model. Um, so I really like that. We've got a quite a bit of images uh, here, Vince, if you wanna just kind of slowly scroll through and- That's what I was gonna do, just keep kinda, I'm just gonna yeah, scan while you talk. I'm just gonna give some comments. One interesting thing that um, I saw in the comments on, on this this entry from Andrew Wade was he, he suggested that uh, Chris should maybe add a little bit of Agrax Earthshade or some kind of wash to parts of the grass 
to break up the uh, the static grass look because this static grass, if you examine it closely, you can see some other colors in there. There are yellows and oranges scattered throughout. But um, adding something like a wash, I've never done that before. But I think that if you could add a little bit more variation to the to the color, I think that would look quite nice. Um, as you keep scrolling, we should see the back of the, the cloth on uh, some of these models at one point. Uh, and when you do, oh, here we go. We can stop here for a moment. Can we zoom in a little bit on the back of the, the, the cloth there? Yeah, so the thing I challenge you on, and this is kind of across most of the models, but you can really see it here, is that I think that the way that you highlighted the orange is a nice smooth transition with uh, thin layers of paint. And here it looks like on the cloak, you didn't you didn't thin it out quite as much. You didn't layer quite as much, and so it can look a little bit splotchy um, when we when we take a close look at it, as if someone were holding up the model and taking a, a nice examination of it. I'd also say that you want to make sure those lines are nice and crisp um, on like the white um, borders of the cloth. And there, I also tend to like to separate the white and you know, say say you're doing white border on a blue gray cloth. I think you want to separate it with a darker color. That can be a really dark blue-gray line between the white and the and the light blue, or it could be black or or some other additional color of your choosing, but something dark, uh, and that'll make it look nice and nice and clean. Uh, you kind of did this up up uh, toward the top where you've got the the black line from the recess between the white and the blue-gray, but I think you really could do it on the bottom as well, and that would um, make it look a little bit cleaner. So let's uh, keep scrolling through, and I'll see if anything else strikes me. Um, I mean, I really just wanted to emphasize that I like the paint scheme, and I like the way that you highlighted up the orange. Um, the only other thing I can think of from from when I took a look at these is, well, let's look at the look of the sword here. That's the thing I want to talk about. Um, here, I think your highlighting on the sword is is a little bit off. I, you're, you're it looks like you're trying to do something like a non-metallic metal where the light reflects, you know, in the opposite corners. I've never actually painted that way myself. I tend to just paint with a with a metal and a wash and some highlights. But if you're going to do that, I think that we've talked in the past about this. So what I'm gathered, what I've gathered from uh, Kieran and Vince's explanation is that you want to hit that ridge line with a nice, nice light uh, highlight, and you want to um, do kind of like a an, a diagonal of highlight across the blade. Um, you guys could speak to that more as we continue to. Yeah, I, I could through. jump in here. So yeah, go ahead. There's lots of different ways you can do non-metallic metal swords, and this is certainly a valid one. This is this is the this is just the opposite two way. So you go from light to dark and dark to light, right? Like that's that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but then in general, you want to keep it almost the same. Like this doesn't get hot enough up here. Um, your dark to, to darker transition is too stark. Like I can see the line of the darkness and it needs to go much smoother. Like non-metallic metal, this type of thing is just like glaze, 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 then glaze some more, then glaze more. And then when you think you've glazed until you're dead, glaze it five more times. Like it really needs to be just smooth, smooth, smooth. Um, but that being said, you, you're you exactly right. Like what would pop this is if this edge was white and this edge was white and this ridge line was white and then if this is a uh blood um like what a blood recess or blood trap i guess uh, blood whatever. channel i think is what that is yeah there you go blood channel if that's what this is meant to be then the edge of this sh needs to catch the light as well um like on well, well, that both sides, side right both there sides, yeah. i think would partially get that yep absolutely i think you'd want to do this side stark and this side in your like let's say this color ish like right in here like you'd want the right side to be slightly more pronounced than the left because yeah. um, the light's coming this way, but it would still be catching reflection. Um, you know, and, and so I, I think those two kind of all those things that this is just a matter of practice with that kind of thing. You just got to keep banging your head against it until you get it. But yes, there you go. I've only ever done the non-metallic metal swords on one project where I was doing like a quick speed painted undead Mordheim warband. And I want it to look like it was a direction. Night. What's that? I said, is everybody ready for the secret technique to know that you're you're going the right direction with non-metallic metal? Oh, what's that? All right. Look at the sword. Let's all do it together. Look at the sword, everybody. Now squint your eyes. Like literally squint. Okay? And when you squint, it will destroy the detail. And if when you're squinty, all you can see is the highlights and lowlights, if those are still stark enough that they show up, you've gone, you, you've done the, you're on the right path. 
<laughs> That's really interesting. There you go. Cool. Well, we should uh, skip through the, the the rest of the pictures just to check, take a quick look as we uh, as we finish up. But yeah, so here we can just see uh, some additional angles of uh, Chris's cool looking group of models. It's a heck of a force. The Yujing are very pretty, and I'm very used to losing to them in group painting competitions. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. Okay. So, uh, what do we got here? We got, we got three fun things. Um, so, why don't I take uh, Tomas's here um, with his magic man and his rune? And then, Jeff, if you want to take the little Slayers with the Dwarven sure. Blood Bowl team, because I know you're, you're working some Blood Bowl right now, so I feel like you might have some things to say about that. And then, uh, Kieran, if you want to take Andrew Wade and, uh, and his yep, yep. old-school uh, fey creature. <laughs> I don't know. All right. So, Tomas, Thomas, all right, let's talk about this. So, um, overall, there are many things I like about this. You gave us one angle, so I'm, I'm going to be a little hard-pressed to comment too deeply, but let me see if I can spell out what I like. Um, we've got some nice shadow catches here in this. I'd like, it's clear we're going, so speaking to continue on with our non-metallic metal theme, um, We've got some nice shadow catches. What we need is the highlights. I need a white ridge here. I need a white ridge here, right? This is where light would be catching um, and things like that. So uh, that's all fine. Um, I don't, you don't, probably don't need to under, you probably don't need to highlight the, the underside much more. The, the underside of a metal like this is catching light reflection. So this is snow. When sun comes down and hits snow, it's super bright. So maybe you would want to take this up to white. Um, I feel like the bird or whatever this is, this magic bird is not as well defined as I would like. I um, mean, that's kind of the story overall. Like your color placement is good. This purple needs a little more balance somewhere. I don't know where that is, but this purple, like the blue is really nicely balanced across this model, the cape and this bird and this rune. And I really love the placement of this rune. This is very interesting because it does balance this bird and this kind of stuff out really well. It creates a nice sight line. Um, and I like the rune. I'd love to see even a little bit of white, brighter white drawn in the center line of this to make it really look like it's popping with energy. Um, but I think my big challenge for you would be just some some brush control. Um, we've got a little bit of sort of messiness here in, in some places, and I think we need to, to clean up, sharpen our lines some. Um, and I think you'll you're that's basically would be my next step for you. Overall, though, very cool. I mean, it's it's a it's a good model, and you've done a great job. You've clearly got a handle on some good, very some very good techniques here with stuff like this, this rune, and your shadowing on the sword is is very accurately placed. All right, any other thoughts? I think you nailed my thoughts there, Vince. Okay. No, oh, nothing else to add. This is a really good touch. I just want to reinforce that because it does create a wonderful element to the composition so and he's placed off center way to go i like a good off center composition yeah okay let's talk about some slayer blood bowl i just like these uh i think it's a really cool project kevin um and i really like to play these at some point hey come to adepticon and let's play blood bowl together on the weekend stupor bowl number 10 as they're calling oh, it oh there it is gone with his throne yeah, let's do it, man. Oh, and by the way, uh, it turns out ogres are terrible, so these tours would murder me. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Um, but, you know, we've got an out-of-production model Blood Bowl game off. It'd be fun. So, I mean, where to start here? Uh, I, I love the way that you painted up the beards uh, and the mohawks. Uh, I love the war paint. I like the, what you've done with the gems. Um, Kevin painted eyes on all of his all of his models. We can see all of those things in effect here in this this image um, right there. Yeah, so you can see those nice looking eyes. Um, you know, small little detail and these eyes aren't particularly well sculpted on these old models. So I think you did an excellent job with them. Um, you know, static grass looks nice. I tend to go for a black lip around the base, but um, you know, you went for more of a, something to match the Blood Bowl pitch, which is, you know, a cool decision, uh, nothing against it. And um, I guess, the one thing that I would say as I was, you know, thinking about these models, I would like to see a little bit more red in the flesh. Um, so, uh, 
a little bit less of the um, that orangey flesh tone, a little bit more crimson in some of the recesses. Something I've been thinking about a lot lately is we've been we were talking about flesh uh, earlier in this uh, PMP video and thinking a lot more about how to get some more red in my flesh. And I think with dwarves and things like ogres and other uh, drunken creatures, it's especially good to do a little bit of ruddiness in the nose. So um, what I've been doing is glazing down. I use carb or crimson because I use GW paints. And then I I, I cut it with a bunch of uh, Lamy and medium to the point where it's probably one part red and three parts medium. And very thinly, I layer up around the nose and under the eyes. And um, it's been adding a lot of interesting depth. And they look like kind of, you know, um, you know, well, drunken or really intense. And uh, uh, like there's a lot of emotion in their faces when you do that. So that's just something that you might think about moving forward it is adding a little bit more color in the flesh. Um, but overall, I think these are these are nice and simple and uh, an effective paint scheme. And you didn't skimp on any of the detail. Uh, everything from painting the football, as we see in this image, to doing the eyes and... It's a really nice looking team. Good job. There's a couple of guys mixed in there that have some extra techie bits on them um, that I quite like. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'd a, love to see more of the war paint. I'm sure it's used to like probably distinguish these two guys mm -hmm. to make right. them special. But yes. and that's fine. I'd, I'd love to see a little bit more of it, maybe just on the face here and there, like a couple of guys with just like streaks or handprints or something like that. I think would be cool. Oh, yeah, and thinking about Blood Bowl, uh, one other thing you could do is put numbers on the back of the bases um, so that you could distinguish which model is which. Unless, I mean, unless you got stories for all these guys and names and everything that you've already done, in which case, you know, that's fine. But just to distinguish, you know, you know, guy going like this, number one, versus guy going like this, number two, you know? Right. Guy with tiny dwarf with slightly different beard and slightly different arm position, yes. All right. <laughs> But All right. You're looking stuff, Kev. It is. All right. Let's talk about Andrew Wade and a little experiment with magic water. Yeah. I'll, I'll come and talk about the, the water second. But, uh, but firstly, um, I like some, some good subtleties of, of composition that he's done here. Andrew's an accomplished painter. He's, he's doing great stuff and, he's, and he handles textures uh, really well and, and gets a lot of color transition from dark to light in every space. So whether that be the flesh on this halfling creature, I'm imagining it to be, um, or, or the leaf that's, that's on its quiver, or the, or the hair, the pink hair, um, all that color transition is really smooth. There's nothing that looks chalky or, or out of place about that. So I'm happy with, with all of that. Um, back to something that we were looking at a little bit earlier, Jeff. Notice how he's gone very coppery with his medals on this. Yeah. Even the arrowhead, even the arrowhead is, is coppery, right? And the trimming around the quiver and the greaves on his, uh, on his forearm, it, it all, it all has that, but it still comes to a very sharp highlight that is, uh, that is virtually silver in all those cases. And I really appreciate how he's done that. I think that's great. Um, when we look at the water, because that's sort of what Andrew brought up in his comments that he wrote in about this, um, some, there's something pretty amazing about this. And that is that he's done clear water, which I'm going to come back and talk about in a second. But if we can get a look at the stones, he has painted the stones underneath there to emulate the reflection of the rippling of water. So it's not actually rippling of water. That's still. Oh, but yeah, that's right. painted onto the stone what would be the light reflection of the ripples of the water and the flow of it, which I think is amazing. Like that looks beautifully realistic. And you almost don't notice it because that water is so absolutely clear. So that's where I think I would go with, uh, if, you, if you, you're obviously going to go and experiment some more with this, with this water stuff. And I think that leaving it absolutely clear is, uh, is, is, almost, is almost a little bit unrealistic. Like there's so much foliage around there. There's so much stone and grit that's going on on the edge of that water flowing that it needs to have some kind of tint to the color. So Andrew, you can either imagine that as some of the algae or greenery from, from the nearby verge of the water that's getting into it and, and coloring it that way, or 
maybe you imagine it as a reflection of the sky above or something like that, but it needs to have a little bit of tint to it. Um, now how to go about that can differ from product to product. Uh, I'm not familiar with the one that you named here as magic water, but if it's a two part epoxy, which I think is what you were describing, um, then that certainly takes to any kind of ink products or, or the washes to a lesser degree. But if you go back in time and get the Games Workshop ink products or the Scale 75 guys, um, that stuff you can just put in with a dropper and use very little of it because it goes a long way. But you can do that when you're stirring up your epoxy mix and blending that together and it will take on that property. So that's my, uh, that's my recommendation. Give it a try. Yep. Uh, totally agree. You're right. Yes. Magic water is a two part, uh, epoxy, uh, resin and, uh, it does have to be mixed as he mentioned, he had some challenges cause it, you, you have to mix it like exactly in the same proportions <laughs> to get it to cure mm -hmm. properly. Um, but yeah, you can, it, it'll, it'll totally take inks and shades and all that kind of stuff really well. So, yeah. and, uh, I agree with everything you said. I, I love the very strange flesh tone of the sort of ochre. I think that was pretty brilliant. Um, cause it still looks very alive right oh, because yeah. of the, the the shading and such he put into it so um, it's great it's it's both otherworldly and yet still very human at the same time because he, he still has these sort of shaded red tones in there so it still looks like there's a, an organic blood pumping thing you know yeah yeah i love it andrew yeah i love this model i think it's just for all the reasons that you guys laid out i think it's really really cool yep all right Okay, so let's see. We're almost to the end. I think we got, I'm trying to figure out how many more we got. Okay, a few more. Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, I can't, uh, how about I'll take uh, Victor's um, uh, carrot acolytes. acolytes. Thank you, yes. Name was eluding me for a moment, even though it was right in front of my face. And then, uh, <laughs> actually, you know what I say? Wait, I, let me, let me, I'm going to flip this around. Um, Jeff, you want to take the Karak Acolytes? If, uh, Kieran, you want to handle the, the Kin Eater for Ninth Age? And yep. uh, I want to talk about this guy over here. Mr. Okay. Mr. Stone Monk. All right. Here we go. Yeah, so, Victor, I mean, you know, much like when we analyzed your uh, Liberator paintings, or your Stormcast Eternal uh, paint jobs, you know, by the fifth or sixth time that we talked about them, we were just like, yeah, all that other stuff we said about how nice they look. Um, so I'm going to struggle to to um, to come up with some new compliments and critiques for you here. But um, one thing that jumps out at me, though, is uh, I really appreciate the way that you highlighted the flesh on these guys and also the way that you varied the skin tones which is kind of cool. I think it's hard to do dark flesh uh, and make it look right. And I think that your models here nail it perfectly. Um, and so that's that's a really good job. I really like the way that you you highlighted up the the flesh. And I don't want to keep bring, <laughs> bringing this back to my Blood Bowl Ogres, but I, I'm going to do it one more time. It's a similar... The way that you blended up your paints on the lighter flesh tone models... And the way that you added color to it is exactly what I was trying to do with my most recent project. And hopefully I'll get some pictures up in the PMP when that's finished in the coming week. But uh, I love the way that you've used line highlighting here. I love the way that you've added color into the flesh. But at the same time, the contrast is present, but it's not so stark as to be, um, as to be jarring. Uh, it, it looks quite natural. I really also like the, the way that you painted the... Uh, that different color on the feet i don't quite understand what it is except that it might be like a zinchian ritual or something but you've got these crimson colors going on on the feet of these models maybe it's like a war paint type thing but um really interesting and uh it's something that one wouldn't expect i've never seen that on these models uh when i've seen them painted up let's uh let's take a look at the uh, the next couple of images and i'll see if there's anything else that i could say beyond what we've already been talking about in the previous couple of submissions these guys are absolutely great for practicing skin tone. Like their muscles are so well defined. They really are a pleasure. Yeah. And they're ripped, but they're not too, too bulky. Like the Kaddish and jungle fighters of old. Um, right. The sure, range. Sure. Yep. These are anatomic, anatomically <laughs> more correct. So agreed. They look good. Uh, yeah, no awesome looking metal there. Um, non-metallic metal that you're using. It's weird. Is, is this entirely non-metallic metal or is that a silver that he's using at the end? 
is it a silver or a white that he's going to with the final highlights on this metal? I, I think it's actually metal underneath with shades of light. Is that what it is? Okay. I was thinking it was not metallic metal. What do you think, Karen? Well, you know what? I, I thought that when I was looking back upon some of Victor's models from even a year ago, and he fooled me because um, because I was on one of these PMPs reviewing his wonderfully crafted non-metallic metal, and his reply was, no, dude, that's just metals. And, uh, okay. And he didn't say this, but I'll say it for him. I'm just that good at it, so deal with it. <laughs> 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 that's the addendum that you're going to add i get it i'm okay. going to add that um, those are those are my words put in victor's mouth i think yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah okay so cool. so yeah i think that i've learned that uh that he's just that good at regular metals that he fools us cool yeah well i think it's beautiful and i mean like just looking at this white uh loincloth or not quite loincloth it's like the cloth under the loincloth um I just I love the way that that's blended up there and and how you play that off of the purple. It just looks really nice. Let's see what those yeah. last two images look like and then we'll stop gushing about them. Sure, it's wonderful shading on white. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a couple more close-ups. Yeah, no, really good stuff, Victor. Keep it up, man. Yep, love these guys. All right, we got a little kin eater. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, I've been looking at uh, been looking at pale flesh models these last few submissions, so I'll just continue to talk about pale flesh, uh, which I think is great. It's, it's it's all fantastic. I think that uh, it comes across here very smooth in a, in a lot of cases. There is a couple of spots where the the deep fold of the muscle shows a little too starkly and doesn't and doesn't come across smoothly. Um, one of those that pops up to me is uh, the underside of his hand that's reaching up in the air. It looks like more so that he's got a gash going down the middle of his hand rather than just a fold in the skin. Um, so I uh, talked about that a little bit with, with Will's submission of his convict guy a while ago that sometimes the wash just ends up going on a little bit heavy. And, uh, and sometimes that you just have to be watchful of where that's going. Throughout most of the rest of the model, like around the rib cage, torso, uh, top of thighs, that all seems pretty fine to me. Um, there's two things that I want to add. I'm talking about the flesh for a second. He's got a number of spots where he's got a bone that is jammed through his flesh. And I think those especially need to be the areas where you still get a little bit of pink out of this, right? Like this guy is a very, very pale model. The idea of these ogre kin eaters is they spend all their time in a dark cave. He, he wears a bandage over his eyes because his eyes are useless anyway because he can't see in all the darkness they usually live in. So there's not a lot of, uh, you know, not a lot of melatonin in these guys' skin. But but I think when you're causing a wound in the model, there's still some kind of lifeblood in there that would that would show around there. Um, so getting in there with a different colored wash, a little more crimson in tone, I think is uh, is the spot to go. Um, if you spin to the next frame, actually, we got to look at his, at his gaping maw. And there is some of that color coming out around there, right? Obviously, the inside of his mouth. But there isn't even a little bit on the bottom lip part where you're coming in with a bit of that crimson or pinkish color. So that's the kind of color that I think would be worthwhile in those other spots where he's jamming a bone through his flesh. Okay. Um, the other thing that I would add is where you've gone with your op opposite color, the black. So you've done that on the fabric, both across his blindfold and, and the loincloth, but you've also done black on his hair tufts that are coming off the back and cascading down his back. Um, in a similar way to what we talked about on Dave's model, when we were dealing with two textures that are sharing the same color, for me to be convinced that they're two different things, you, you got to vary that texture just a little bit or, or vary the color or the way that you highlight it. Um, so I might suggest that you go and do the hair just a little bit differently. Um, maybe your absolute base color for that is not entirely black. Maybe it's just a little bit lighter than that and then build up from it so that we can tell that it's, that it's a couple of different things. Uh, you yeah, nailed all my one last frame, And I want to say something about the last frame as well. Before oh, we... sure. Here you go. And that is that he's found some kind of, some kind of app here or, or something from the ninth age website where he can 
create like a, a unit card for these things. And uh, this is the first I've seen this. I've been playing the ninth age for quite a number of months now and I haven't stumbled across this, but now I'm intrigued. I want to go make them. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, I do love it. If we're going to have a quote though, I, I need to, who is this attributed to? Like, where's my quote attribution? <laughs> it feels like an orc because of the ungry, right? But I need to know like, or a goblin perhaps. There you go. <laughs> but yes, I like it. It's a cool card. I dig that. <laughs> Maybe it's his own quote. Maybe he just needs uh, to sign it. It could be. <laughs> Well, I'll sign your quote. Maybe yeah. he talks about himself in the third person. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So, Mr. Stone Monk. All right. So, uh, Mr. Stone Monk. Let's 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 zoom around here. Here we go. Let's give the front shot. Um, so this was his Orcish Warlord, and uh, I this was from Holy Havoc, um, and he ended up taking uh, Best Warlord for this model, beating yours truly out. So there you go. I feel that's why I felt as though I. Uh, I wanted to talk about this. Um, <laughs> we have a personal vendetta now set up. No, this is great. Um, so here's here's the cool things he did. I, you're going to see it here in, in some of these later frames. Let's take a look at this model. This is sort of how he's starting out. You can see he's on this broken piece of, of um, uh, what do I want to call it? Like floor. Temple. Or, yeah, temple. Um, and we talked about how he did this last time, right? He has the... the um, uh, the cork that he's taken and laid the AOS basing thing down on and then puttied it and sanded it, which looks great. We got all the dead ogre bodies. This guy has conquered um, here. So look at his bow, the arrow, dead bodies. So now let's go forward. So now we can see this is his sort of final form. He's on the, the bigger temple uh, base here. And look at the pile of dead now beneath him as he's conquered some <laughs> things. And uh, you look at also the notice the bow is a much more significant thing. Um, so this model was all magnetized. Also, let's go ahead and look back here. Let's look at his chest here and up here. Now let's mm -hmm. go up here. Notice the addition of the war paint. Um, so the trick with this tournament was that you had a warlord that was leveling up throughout the tournament. And by the end, he was a straight killer. Like this dude was not to be trifled with. And, um, so Stone Monk magnetized his hands and magnetized the base. And we'll kind of see how that looks in a moment. So that in between games, as the Warlord leveled up and became more dangerous, he could represent that in the model. Um, and he got up to this huge, insane, uh, massive bow. So let's, here's his, we can see him starting to level up here as we pile some slightly more ornate bow. And he, we got some more orcish bodies that he's conquered. And then there's the full spread from original <laughs> bow. And he had the melee weapons made too, just in case he ended up going for a, cause you could go, you could go archery or melee throughout the thing. So, um, wow. what a sweet idea. There you go. So all, That's all good. magnetized, all very clever. There's this, you can see the big giant head in the sand in the back. Really, really fun. Um, yeah. and, and as Steve said, you can see he added all this war paint throughout. <clears throat> so he was like, he was painting after games and stuff. Like, <laughs> <laughs> adding to the model what um, a great idea yeah absolutely so as, as steve said and i i totally agree um there you go there's there's the various piles <laughs> that he's got which is nice um he you know uh stone monk really leaned into the narrative of the event and this warlord was something super fantastic took a lot of planning and and came together just fantastically well. So big congratulations for that win, buddy. This was a a wonderful, wonderful idea, and uh, I I love how it all came out. So oh yeah, big style points for all that. Absolutely. Yeah, Eric's one of those guys that goes the extra mile with his hobby, and uh, well deserved. I'm I'm glad that he uh, he plays strongly there. Absolutely. All right. So I think. Uh, oh no, we got a few after that. All right. So. Oh, yeah, where, where I'm trying to figure out. Okay, so there you go. All right, so let's do this. Kieran, you want to take your two here? And then we'll yeah, do then we'll give you up the last three. Sure. Okay. Okay. So uh caveat first of all. Base is coming later, people. <gasps> I did see that in the description. So as always, if you put that in the description, you get the pass. Yeah, okay. Good. So um these were all converted because uh I couldn't find aside from the Mantic guys, anybody who made um, spears for dwarves. So uh, I, I want to just say a little bit about this. Drilling out the hands on these things 
to fit in the plastic rod that I bought um, kind of blew out a few hands. So a couple of them are looking a little bit rough or missing a finger or kind of mangled. Uh, but, uh, but hopefully I didn't take any photo angles that you can see that too, obviously. Uh, but they were all repurposed from, from old dwarfs that I had. Um, I also, this is the first time that I significantly used um, the, the model, the Vallejo model air um, metallic paints, the silvers. Um, so I started to, I didn't painstakingly do these spear tips, but I tried to, I tried to make them a little bit more transition of light to dark on the spear tips, even in small space. So that was a bit of an experiment for me. Um, I don't think there's anything else much to say about them other than, other than those two aspects. Do we want to talk about the banner on the next one? Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's closer, tighter shots of that. Sure. Um, nice orange and blue. Good contrast. All right. Let's talk mm-hmm. about the banner here that, that you, you modeled after, after truly one of my favorite things. So do you want to explain what this is right here? Yeah. So, uh, for, for the people that uh, spent time in front of their PC, this is an image from the Lord of the Rings online game. Uh, which is full of great imagery, actually. I'm going to have to go spend more time there as I do more banners in the future for this dwarf army. But this was a gate of the uh, starting zone for, for some dwarfs on the, in the Blue Mountains. Um, and it was just, it, it felt very Tolkien and stylized for me. When I wanted to do the banner, so flip into the banner now, I wanted to do, instead of some usual icons or runic image, I wanted to do something that was more of a tapestry. So... Um, the wisps of cloud in there were the hardest part about doing this actually trying to keep that subtle without, uh, without, you know, doing too heavy of a lining. So this was a combination of a little bit of, uh, a little bit of those micro pens just to frame it out. But then I ended up painting on top of the micro pens anyway, because the lining was just too bold um, and some sort of soft color transitions in the, in the mountains in some ways to still remain a little bit cartoony. Uh, I, yeah. I like the way that you've painted this in with, with in a very stylistic way. So yeah, it looks a little bit cartoony, but um but I think it's really in keeping with the uh the kind of light hearted dwarf color scheme that you chose of like a very vibrant so these don't seem to me to be as like angry, vicious, grumpy dwarves. They seem more colorful and and uh and I think that the banner kind of matches that nicely. Yeah. Um, the other thing I tried to do within there um, is I tried to do some kind of striation of the fabric, which was all done underneath here, but then largely painted over with the, with the image when it was put on. But around the edging and, and above the mountain peaks, you can see a little bit of cross hatching that I tried to do in there. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, I did it on the backside as well, but I didn't take a snapshot for you guys to look at. It's more obvious on the backside. That kind of thing. Yeah, that gives a nice little sense that it's a it's a woven cloth. Yeah, and the other thing I tried to do as well, so that orange framework around the sides and the top um, doesn't really have any movement to it, like it's flat on the model the way that it's sculpted. But I tried to do some movement to it with the way that I highlighted. Uh, now to do that though, I had to go to a brighter highlight than I did on the rest of the orange on the bottom part of the model, and I discovered another use for flesh. So I started to mix in flesh with my orange to get the, the brightest highlight on that. Yep. Absolutely. That's the way you do it. Yep. I was going to comment on that because it's actually the thing that jumped out. Like the freehand is amazing, but after looking past that, what jumped out to me is I love that you have these darker desaturated brown tones worked in here, here mm-hmm. and here. It does create much like it's, it's a subtle thing. You might not even really notice it looking at it, but it does so much. Um, so yeah, I really dig that. Yeah, I just want to say the purpose for doing that was it was flat, like like absolutely flat, planar, and it didn't look like it was fabric in that in those positions. If I painted it just straight up, right? No, it's great. And your idea about mixing in flesh as that final highlight is is great, so you don't bleach out the color. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't want to go into yellow. Right, right. Keeps it orange. I mean, flesh is lightened orange. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, like, if you take red and yellow, mix it together into an orange on your palette, and then start adding white, you will get flesh tone. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's, like, so, 
you know, it, it absolutely makes sense because flesh is actually just a very high highlight of orange. Mm -hmm. That's why you right. get so much interest when you add in, you know, uh, greens and purples and, and reds. Absolutely. All right. So let's, uh, I think we got, this is our last three. So let's, uh, let's split it up here. Um, okay. So let's see. Uh, we got peel tags next unit of, uh, of Zinchi chaos warriors. Um, and then well, let's we've talk got... about, uh, let's talk about Desmond's things together. Cause that's a group effort. Yep. Group he's effort. Of, he's got a couple of frames actually. And Let, let's just move through yeah. all three of these together. Here we go. Say, that's a good idea. We'll, we'll wrap it up here together. So we saw peel tags unit. This is unit two. Uh, I love everything about this unit. Let me just go ahead and I'll, I'll start. Uh, it's fantastic. This takes the normal sort of more stock standard chaos warriors and just goes to 11. Um, wonderful post. Um, I love the tentacles. I love the use of the dryad heads. I love that the fleshy middle part of the face is the highest highlight, drawing all the attention there. We've got some solid freehand knocking around on all this extra green stuffing he's done on the shields for these cloths. Um, yeah, I like I, I like a lot of what's going on here. Yeah, this is really championship level uh, armor blends. Like it's just so very soft. Um, we see this, of course, with with Victor every month, but uh, but it's great to see it from other fellows as well, doing the same similar caliber. You know, it's just a really soft, soft transition, and and in the in the realm of teal, um, which. I'm a little bit shy about doing. I really appreciate the effort there. And then how about on that accent color where he's, he's working both ends of the color wheel by going from a dark purple to a, a light yellow um, yeah. as he, as he shows the gradient there. That's a really cool effect as well. I yeah, agree. The place that I like that the best actually is he's got a guy just a little off, uh, a little off sent to the, from the banner and he's got that dry at arm. No, oh, here? Just, just to the right. Yeah, just to the right of center. So he's got that yep. dryad claw arm. It's got a little bit of tentacle wrap around it. Mm -hmm. So the arm itself is uh, is doing the same transition that he's doing on the heads and the ones back. Yeah, but he's got you know a purposefully purple wrapping around that as a tentacle. I think that looks great. Mm -hmm. Props also for the bases. Uh, those are those are nice and clean and uh, and they don't distract from the intense colors that he's got in other parts of the model. Yep. And I like that even the stone is a little bit blue, right? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a blue concrete just to tie in to the color of the armor. It's great. Little touches. Yeah. And having converted up a lot of these models myself, I know that trying to get them to look anything resembling dynamic is difficult. Um, and I think that he's achieved it there with all of those, um, the, those conversions to the arms. I agree. All right. Yeah, wonderful. I can't wait to see this whole army together. This is his uh, Budget of Sigmar II army, and I think this is just going to be fantastic. Nice. Mm, yeah, it's very striking already. All right. So Desmond says his daughters and, and himself, his daughters are 5 and 11, did a bit of painting. All right. So let's let's see what we've got here. Let's take a look at this conglomeration. Now, obviously, we don't know who <laughs> painted what. Um, I'm going to guess this might have been the youngest here. So his daughter um, was fi daughters were five and 11, he says. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing our solid block colors are more probably the younger one. Um, I, I think so. That's probably how they're grouped. So I'm thinking this is probably five, right? Yep. This is probably 11. Yep. And then let's go. And then this is probably Desmond himself with the, the pink horror. So let's, let's like go it. back. Yeah. So... Um, not a lot to say here, except that it's good. You're starting them young and, uh, she has an eye for a lot of color. Oh, yeah. He said daughters. Okay. I want to make sure I wasn't missing anything up there. Um, she's clearly got an eye for a lot of colors. I like, and I love this, this sort of teal and purple combination on this girl. Let's that's, we just need it. Clearly we just need to work the brush control over the next couple of years and she'll be good to go. Her color choice is already spot on purple and pink on the back as well. <laughs> She got a great eye for color at five years old. <laughs> yeah, she she's having some fun with it. That same bones model that you did, Vince. Yes, yeah, the dryad. Yep, absolutely. Right. On the far right. Yep, that's it. Um, okay, so let's let's move on here. So now we get to the eleven-year-old, um, who again, I, I you know, like is is making a lot of of good solid choices here. I don't know how much 
uh, Desmond is helping. But if the, I, if this is mostly uh, her choices, then then please compliment her. We've got some really nice purple to pink transitions here. This is rather smooth and nice. Like already already soft blending. Yeah, I know, right? That's what I was I thinking too. I was like, that's quite a smooth blend there. I think um, I was probably 28 before I figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so very, very fun stuff. Um, clearly that's just, you know, like there's, there's a lot of, uh, young potential here. So I'd say keep at it and keep painting and, and you've got, you got a big career ahead of you there. Yeah. I'd say she, she already has an eye for the color application and, uh, and, and composing the model as a, as a piece. So that's really good. Yep. Absolutely. And then, uh, and then finally let's come to, uh, where are we at? There it is. Uh, Desmond's piece himself, which we're assuming all this, we don't know that, but I think that's how he probably broke it up. Um, which is fun. Um, I think Desmond, my, my feedback for you would be what we needed here was a final pink glaze to soften all these hard edges. Um, when you're highlighting up pink, you're probably adding in white or a very light color of pink. And that means white is added to it to make it lighter, which means that the edges are going to be very hard and everything is going to look very stark. So you have to then either, if you don't want to sit there and do a lot of very smooth glazes to slowly build colors, you can go with this darkness, but then you got to glaze at the end to bring everything together. It'll make it less noticeable. Um, I was going to say that there's a lot of opportunities on here to do some gemstones if you want to spend some extra time at it, Desmond. Um, so uh, give that a go. There's... I don't know that we've seen a lot today. I, I guess uh, I guess on Victor's stuff, he's got a few gemstones there to look back upon. Um, I don't know there are any obvious ones. The, the, been a, the dwarf really blood ball team, team too. Months. Yeah, yep. It's been a gemstone light month overall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no Eldar releases this month. Is that why? Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, the dwarfs had some, didn't they? There was a couple yeah, the dwarf blood yeah. ball team did. I was saying, yeah. yeah so use those for reference or look back on prior months. Um, there's all kinds of references on how to do them. Um, I think I talked about doing some of those last month too. So you don't have to go far. There you go. I would also say um, your girls were outpacing you, Desmond. You did, I, I couldn't help but notice here, you did one model. That's it. Your girls were outpacing you. you got to pick it uh, up. He's got, a, he's got a point there. <laughs> don't taunt Desmond too much though, because that that boy will paint twenty or thirty models in a week just to spite you. <laughs> oh, Willie! Really? He's running laps around me, man. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm the slowest banner. All right, so let's end up with uh, Hashut and his corn demon Ken army. Uh, we've got some some darker some darker pictures here, um, so it's it's going to be a little tough to comment. Um, what I'll say is that from what I can tell. Uh, I think it looks good. What I'd love to see is some darker cuts in the plates, um, in, in the space for you. It's a little hard to tell. Like we need, we need to focus these pictures up, get some better lighting. It's, it's hard to comment without, without those things in place. Cause like we're pretty, pretty out of focus here. Um, but what initially jumps out at me is I don't have a lot of strong contrast lines. Um, so I need, I need the darker lines cutting up the armor, stuff like that. Uh, let's, let's ask, uh, let's ask this actually. Um, seeing as this, he he probably hurriedly snapped these photos to get it in on the 30th of November. Um, let's ask you, Hashuit, that if you're watching this, um, see if you can get some some different lighting on photos for us, and we'll we'll talk more thoroughly about it in December. I like it. Give me a clean white diffused light. Set the model on a book, like we've seen. Like I'm glad to see so many people doing that. That's great. Oh, Use yeah. that. Just go back. Like look at half the people who submitted this month who are all doing that. And it makes it so much easier to review the model. It's the easiest free background you'll ever have. Cause you probably already have a book. If you're playing the game, you've got a book. I can almost guarantee it. So maybe, you know. <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> uh, you could, you could print, you could print something out from the ninth age website. That's all I'm saying. There you go. Yeah. I'm sure yep. you could. So we think we think we got some good uh, some good models here, Hasha, and we just want to be able to give you the precise uh, critique and feedback that you deserve. Exactly. All right. So there we go. That brings us to the end of the November review. Mm -hmm. All right, gentlemen. So, you got any favorites? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So so. 
does anyone want to assign or, or pick their their favorite for the month? Who's who's got a selection? Well, I think that uh, I got I got one and a half. Oh, okay. So my half is the redo that Ambastir did back. Um, it's it's that troglodon you, with the stink rider. Peter, you stole my one. I was going to pick because I was going to credit him for, oh, really? for taking good advice. I swear. That's all right. So it's That's so it's, we'll double down. We'll double down and say that. Uh, no, I've got a second pick. It's okay. Go ahead. You're good. Okay. Well, I'll just do my half then. So that was my half pick. So so the redo that he did after the, after the feedback of adding the extra jade color in some uh -huh. spaces along the model uh, really brought that one to to full completion and uh, and it was pretty pleasing. So there, I'll leave you guys to the rest. Yeah, thinking through, we had a lot of great submissions this month, but uh, I don't want to forget about uh, Mickey Genvers. Um, well, now I hate both of you. Okay, go ahead. Ice race, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah the the uh that ice um ice sort the frost weaver um that she did i think that was really good and uh vince i'll steal one more of yours uh maybe um i thought andrew <laughs> wade's good think, lord yeah i think that model <laughs> <laughs> okay that was gonna be my other one but that's fine whatever well, you like well which one I, i'm talking about the one from because he had two and they're both excellent but i was gonna say the one this month we just or this month they're both this month this uh most recent portion of the show where he did the water effect and oh, okay. uh and painted his lines and i thought that was just yeah it, until kieran said it i didn't realize how how awesome that was and um man if he's just getting started with water effects and experimenting i'd love to see where he is in a couple of months after working with it yeah so. Um, I'm going to pick Andrew's other one. I love that old school Ralph Partha Draconian, and he did such a, a wonderful, loving, caring job with it. Miniature Necromancy, I think is what he called it. But that was that was going to be my my other choice. Honestly, I all of those are, are truly great and a bunch more. Um, there's there's so many great things I love this month. The the community is really stepping up, not only in their individual submissions, but with the budget of Sigmar stuff. It's 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 just fantastic. So mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. As always, what we what we say is um, you know, none of this is about approaching perfection or some nonsensical idea like that. This is just about taking the next step in whatever your hobby journey is and, you know, working on a new technique, finishing, you know, uh, improving on one particular challenge or opportunity you have. And I'll say it again. I know I said it at the top of the show, but if you want to join us on your hobby journey, we would love to have you no matter whether you're the newest novice that just picked up the brush or um, somebody who's been painting for years and years and years. We'd love to have you. The link's down below join up and uh, all, all that is required is a a a good attitude and a wish to take the next step um what other what other closing thoughts did you have gentlemen no i'll stay i'll stay quiet this time that's a, <laughs> that's a good wrap up satisfies me very good yeah. I, th I think you hit the nail on the head there, Vince. And also just to say that uh, I saw a lot of great positive feedback in the comments this month as we usually do. And um, you know, just, we do this one show where we give all of our um, extensive thoughts and it's great to see everyone else pitching in throughout the month before, uh, before we have the opportunity to review who are giving that motivation from day to day. So excellent work there. Agreed. Yep. I was going to say the same thing. It's, it's really everybody who gives all that feedback every day that really makes the community hum. So thank you very much to everybody who submits to everybody who comments to everybody who's interacting. That's the point of this community. That's what it's all about. And thank you all for watching. We really appreciate it. And as always, we'll see you next time.